In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight and watching us at home. Hope everyone survived this storm. I know I was completely shocked when I walked out of my house early this morning to find a foot of snow. I certainly didn't expect that, but uh, it is winter, so, and uh, as always, our DPW and our public safety folks were super busy. We appreciate all their efforts throughout the evening and all day long. Uh, we, uh, we have, we're going to start the evening off. We're going to come back to board member reports and public comment. We're going to start the evening off with a quick discussion on the North Reading Dollars for Scholars. Would you like the podium? Hello, I'm Kathy Achavati, and I'm here for the North Reading Dollars for Scholars. And I'm asking for the proclamation for our phonathon starting March 11th to the 14th. So, oh, Mr. Chairman, I move to proclaim the week of March 10th through March 14th. It's not actually a week, but it's less than a week, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a four-day, Monday through a Thursday. Up. Monday through Thursday, March 10th through uh, March 14th, be not running dollars for Scholars Week, and to read the proclamation. Second. I have a motion and a second. Will you vote for us, right? Or do we read the proclamation first? I can read the proclamation if you like, and then you can decide if you like what you're hearing. Sure. Okay. <laughs> proclamation. Whereas the Citizen Scholarship Foundation, CSF, is a group of hardworking, dedicated individuals, and whereas the Citizen Scholarship uh, Foundation members have devoted both time and talent to the difficult task of seeking scholarship funds for deserving students, and whereas Citizen Scholarship Foundation is planning its annual phonathon for the week of March 10th through 14th, 2019, where high school students will contact all North Reading homes by telephone, seeking pledges to the Citizen Scholarship Foundation Fund. Now therefore, we, the Select Board of North Reading, do hereby proclaim the week of March 10th through 14th, 2019, as Citizen Scholarship Foundation Dollars for Scholars Week, and urge all citizens to open their hearts and their purses to the benefit of North Reading students who want to continue their education uh, will be signed by Michael A. Prisco, Chairman of the Select Board. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the matter? Mr. O'Leary. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it every year, as long as I'm here, is that uh, this is a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of effort that's put in every year uh, by the citizens' volunteers and uh, the kids at the high school level who have been asked to volunteer and make the phone calls. Uh, I personally have known uh, and family have benefited from Citizen Scholarship Foundation as my boys went to school and uh, every every bit helps I mean I think Absolutely. well you don't know yet Andy. your kids out there you're just <laughs> almost there uh, but one. schools are extremely expensive and everything from uh, you know, just the books or anything else so anyway uh, I would urge everybody to please um, participate and um, to give generously and we were very fortunate um, my father was served for a number of years on the school committee. We were able to endow a fund in his name, and it was uh, an honor that people, you know, when he passed away, actually donated to the Citizen Scholarship Foundation uh, in his memory and uh, continue to do so. So I would urge people to continue to support and uh, support the proclamation. Thank you, Mr. We were able to give away $30,000 last year, so we have been successful, and we do need help. So when your phones ring and you get your envelopes in the mail, we'd love for you to have them returned. Thank you. Any other board member? I will just say that I know uh, firsthand. I have a recent graduate and I also have a daughter in college. And uh, my son uh, is a recent graduate. His friends now are deferring their student loans. And they would have loved to have a scholarship, even if it was $500. That's uh, they minimum, see the benefit 500. of having these multiple scholarships because every penny counts, because it's expensive. And Mr. O'Leary is 100% right. It's not getting cheaper, and it doesn't seem like it's going to change anytime soon. And so we really thank the 
no, our, all the scholars yeah, for our applications are way up. Yeah, so. oh, I, I can understand. And we try our best. And if you weren't there, we really wouldn't have another source for them. Uh, and this, this is great. open to all North Reading residents. It's great. Thank you. So Thank you. Nothing else said. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you again you. for coming in. Hey, Kathy, you're always looking for volunteers, correct? Please. Please. <laughs> and there's a website, right? So if you're interested in supporting and helping out on uh, the collection efforts or just to participate uh, as a volunteer, uh, the North Reading Dollars for Scholars has a website. Please look into it. They could certainly use some more manpower. Thank you. Thank you again, Kathy, for coming in this evening. Next, we have board member reports. Uh, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, uh, we continue uh, to negotiate uh, for some land out on, uh, on Route 28 uh, for a location for the uh, Chlorination plants uh, get a little bit of a bump on the road here, but we hope to have it resolved and hope to have a more favorable report uh, at our next meeting. Uh, we continue to meet, Mr. Masseri and myself, uh, with our consultants, and uh, we have more meetings scheduled. So uh, stay tuned. Do you have a an estimated completion date? Do you really have that law? Um, if it can be finalized, do you have a dead drop dead date that we have to meet? No. We don't, okay. No, other than we can't finalize the FEIR until we have an absolute location and they've actually uh, consultants have looked at the location to see what's gonna have to be done. But, uh, but we're working uh, as fast as we can. And if we have to change course, we will, but we're hopeful that we don't. And on the Andover side of the tunnel line for water, everything's still progressing? Still progressing. We have meetings uh, tentatively scheduled uh, to meet with officials and have our uh, technical personnel meet with their technical personnel and we hope to have a meeting a joint meeting with the representatives of Andover uh, later this month that's great so uh, they that's have they have good. some work to do too in relation to the questions which have been raised uh, at the state level and they've committed to working expeditiously to uh, respond to those inquiries so thank you we appreciate their efforts Andover's efforts mr. Masseri uh, as a follow-up to what Steve was saying uh, the filing FBIR, there are two hurdles that we're aware of at this date. One is identifying the locations where we're going to build the chlorine injection plants. And the second is a bunch of questions that we're waiting for Andover to answer. It's related to them identifying how they're going to supply the capacities, etc. cetera. Uh, I got a call from somebody interested in knowing there any plans for the 4th of July evidently there's some interest in maybe getting that going again I know nothing else beyond that at this point I don't know if anyone else has heard anything I not, yeah. it's been a couple of years right since we yeah it's been a couple of years unfortunate of fun, uh, part of funding it, it's the funding it's very expensive to run them yeah. uh, not only just to, to pull it off but to have the public safety support to manage people, to, to keep people safe, mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, we ran into an example that one evening with the bad weather, but it was a you know, coordinated effort, and we need to have the funds to have those people available under those situations. So that's what makes it challenging, but it, it is a nice service if we could have offered it. Uh, but maybe we can try to reach out to whoever the last person, I think it was Mr. Vino maybe was the last contact for, I remember. Before the July committee, does that sound right? No. Uh, no. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll look into it. Yeah. I'll follow up with the and town administrator. Yeah. Nancy Wolf. Thank you. Nancy Wolf was the contact. And one last <coughs> comment. I woke up this morning to a foot of snow, and I looked out the window, and the street was down a pavement. And I'd like to thank the DPW for their efforts in getting things cleaned up quickly. Especially for those that had it, not me, but for those that had it, go off to work early this morning. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Schultz. Uh, real briefly, uh, for the dog lovers out there, I reached out to the uh, Dave and Meredith Burns who are leading the charge of getting a dog park in North Reading, and that's still on the, the planning stages, but the people are still out there looking. They're going to be working with the Parks Department to find a suitable location. So. Uh, if anybody's interested in working with them to try to bring a dog park to North Reading, please let me know. Thanks. Ms. Welcome back, Jane. <laughs> and uh, 
just the same thing as uh, Mr. Masseri. Great job. DPW did an excellent job clearing everything up. <coughs> Kids were thrilled they didn't have school. They were happy to learn about that yesterday instead of this morning, but I was happy to be able to get out to get out to work and everything was safe and good to go early this morning. So that's it. And uh, I just my only thing is the folks that are still interested, uh, they still have time to pull papers and you know attend some of the meetings that are going on. Even if you're haven't quite decided to, you know, we are having these budget hearings every uh, meeting going forward for the next several weeks. So if uh, you know you're interested, you, the time is still available to come to town hall, pull papers, get out, get your signatures. Uh, but I want to thank the folks that have come in and pulled papers, and I wish them luck getting their signatures. And, I think it's a wonderful thing for the community. Without folks stepping up, we, we wouldn't be here. I and mean, we wouldn't be able to manage our government, our town government, and our schools. So that's all I have. Uh, we'll go to the next thing, which is public comment. Anyone here for public comment? Okay. Next, approve the approval of confidential disclosure form. <coughs> Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, the board should have received in its meeting packet a uh, memorandum relative to this request and then uh, late this afternoon or earlier this evening in the Dropbox folder for the meeting there is a copy of uh, a um, memorandum from town council as well as a, a series of disclosures and uh, so this request relates to um, my ability to discharge my duties uh, and the location of my um, a property that I own in town. Uh, the property in question is an abutter to an abutter of town owned land on which the Tower Hill water tank is located and is also uh, property that is abutting the property on which the middle and high school are located. So uh, in the course of my um, owning this property there's been um, um, ministerial or other incidental matters that have come up with regard to uh, my involvement um, that are not substantial in nature which is the term that triggers a uh, closer review under the conflict of interest law. Um, and some of those things have included purchase orders relative to maintenance of the property. Um, more recently, the um, um, <coughs> installation of the communications towers for our public safety communications system. Uh, my work on the secondary school building committee uh, as a member, but also as a town's procurement officer. Uh, but more recently, a couple of things have come up that have caused a closer look and uh, for me to be before you this evening to ask for your consideration and I've tried to break that down into basically uh, three items that are out there. One is relative to the least um, areas of the property on which the water, the tower, the water tower is located. Um, some of the board members may know we have leases with multiple cellular, cellular phone carriers uh, for, for, uh, for terms of I think between five and ten years. Uh, one of those uh, is asking to make modifications to their property for the replacement of equipment um, and, it, I, and I've been um, asked to um, weigh in on it. Um, another has asked for a potential review of the term for the lease um, for one of its, pr uh, one of its uh, tower locations, not on Tower Hill, uh, but now has asked for a, a review of the <coughs> Tower Hill location as well. Um, again, so that's uh, an abutter to, abutter to an abutter of property that I own. Um, and so before I went further with that, I'm asking the board to, um, to review that. That's what the first is related to the leased areas. The second is relative to the future of the water tower itself. And I know uh, select board members, Ms. Ari uh, and uh, O'Leary are, are aware that there's been some discussion relative to the future of the water tower at Tower Hill, whether it's going to be needed or not. And I, I don't think that we're at a point where any determination is made. But honestly, I don't know that because I've excused myself from any of the discussions that have taken place on it. Um, but I, I do think at some point in time it's going to uh, generate more discussion either within the working group or within the, the board or the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. So I'm asking for the board's guidance on uh, that issue. That's the second issue. Uh, and then the third issue is more related to the so-called ministerial acts that go on uh, day to day, which uh, in all honesty, I, I think council and I felt do not rise to the letter level of any sort of a conflict. And those could be signing off on the town's property and casualty insurance or um, occasionally uh, licenses to access property for some particular reason. Um, 
there may be uh, appropriations that include funding for the maintenance of the property uh, within it, either for the schools or for the town. And as everyone knows, I am involved in the budget process. So that's the third area of concern. And I've kind of broken that down into three separate disclosures for the board's consideration. And so after talking with town council, the board's options are to um, make a determination. And I put this in a motion that's at the rear of uh, at the, the last couple of pages of the packet that I put in this evening. You could make a determination that uh, the potential um, conflict or financial interest that I may have is not substantial for each of those matters. Uh, or you could also approve of the delegation of responsibility um, and it would be my recommendation to uh, delegate to the Public Works Director because most of these issues relate to town-owned land that the DPW is involved in. It really is the board's decision uh, relative to what it is most comfortable with. I've provided information that would allow you to um, make three separate decisions if you felt differently about each of these particular categories. Um, again, the first being relative to the, the, leases, the, the leased property and the leases themselves with these cellular carriers. The second being relative to the future of the water tower itself, whether it remains as is, is replaced, is repaired, or otherwise addressed. And then again, the, uh, the third being the ministerial acts. And so I think that really the, the, the motion <coughs> captures what the options are, and obviously each of the three disclosures include um, some some op uh, some detail for the town or for the select board. Excuse me. And I'm happy to answer any questions to the extent that I can. Any board members have some questions, Mrs. Minyapelli? So to to the read of it, it's because it's not because your parcel abuts it, but you're the abutter to the abutter. However, because you're within a specific distance, that in sort of implies or imputes a potential conflict. Correct. Yeah, that's right. It's 300 feet, I believe. And so you, if in your, if, um, I'm not sure if this has ever arisen before, but in terms of negotiating a prospective contract with a vendor, it would seem to me likely that, you know, whatever option the board decides, if the option would be to designate someone else, that would probably fall to our finance director right or uh, so that's an option that we could um, that we could look at um, th these issues are more um, relative to what takes place within the structure of the lease with the exception of the term um, the financial terms were dictated by a procurement process that was done competitively under chapter 30b um, and it was a oh, recommendation okay. made by my pre predecessor to the board to sign off on contracts and I, I want to say that they're 10-year terms and we are it, it probably the eighth year in some of them. Some of them were five-year terms with options for extension. Um, but these are all, um, in terms of the negotiation, my understanding, again, I wasn't here, was that they were procured using Chapter 30B, oh, and right. the low bidder was selected. Okay. So those but again, that the, the board they could. They pre-existed your even owning the parcel. These agreements did, that's correct. So my understanding is it's sort of a, an urgent need. We have to address this tonight because we, we have a potential customer to add some more to the, to the tower, is that correct? Th that's correct. So the one that is more time sensitive is the first one relative to the communications leases. Uh, we have um, uh, at least one um, lessee who is under uh, an obligation of the Federal Communications Commission to make some improvements to their equipment and they are looking for uh, an approval. Um, again, the forms that, uh, that I've been presented with provide an option for uh, sign off by the uh, the director of public works or the building superintendent, but I have been consulted in, uh, in w with regard to that, and I, I more want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. So for me, it's you know, revenue is very important. You know, in the, you know, I consider anybody that we have a lease with as a customer to the town, and we need to make sure that we can administer these leases to make sure make sure that we don't affect their operations. So um, I do hope we can act on it tonight. It's important, and then the future of the tower. Uh, I'd have to leave it up to Mr. Masseri and Mr. O'Leary to sort of advise us on, you know, what is the future of the tower? What do you? I mean, is it? I can't imagine it's anytime soon that we'd be considering abating that tower, taking it down, removing it. Well, a, based upon our information from the consultants, there's a question as to whether or not once we start uh, getting all of our water from Andover whether or not we need the storage capacity, all the storage capacity that we currently enjoy. Um, that being the case, it would potentially be, you know, the Tower Hill Tower 
that uh, likely could be abandoned. Uh, whether the town decides to abandon it or not will be determined by, by this board uh, at, a, at a later date. Yeah, but no proposal yet has been put forth to do so. And again, based on this proximity, uh, people could uh, find an appearance of, uh, of a conflict uh, if we thought that that was the case. Uh, the, the other two matters, you know, I, I don't have any, any qualms about uh, this town administrator who happened to live in another section of town and moved to Tower Hill Road uh, not too long ago. Um, he moved there knowing that the tower was there. Okay. You know, he knew he moved there knowing that the that the antennas were there. Uh, so it was a conscious decision to move into that neighborhood, and it didn't have a, a detrimental uh, impact on his determination that he wanted to live two doors down from the water tower. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't have any qualms about Mr. Gilberto uh, acting uh, in the town's best interest. Uh, on, uh, first of all, on any of the matters, um, you know, but the only one that I think that would pose the, the most of an appearance of, of a potential uh, financial interest would be whether the tower stays or goes. Right. Um, but even in that particular case, as I pointed out, Mr. Gilberto moved there not knowing that there was a potential option that the tower would come down. So I don't think it was a, a decision knowing that he could influence it was coming, coming or going in any way. So I, personally, I don't have a problem in uh, having the board suggesting to the board that that the that it's not so substantial as to, to be deemed likely, you know, that the integrity of the services and all the rest. So, personally, I, I would be in support of all three allowing them to continue to participate or to continue no, to participate in the discussions of the, the lease long-term planning in relation to the uh, water tower itself. And again, it's more of ministerial acts in relation to the middle school, high school uh, property, which needs to be done. Yeah. Mike. Mr. Masseri. We recall a couple years ago, there were some issues with the tower, and there was gonna be some expenses, and then they were cut down by changing the bolts that secure the uh, tower to the ground. So the tower has reached an age where we may not have a choice in the future as to what to do to it. Mm -hmm. And that's putting aside whether it's needed or not. Yep. Anyone else? Mr. Gilbert? I, I didn't offer to excuse myself while you deliberate. <laughs> so I <laughs> should have, perhaps. I apologize, and I'm happy to if you'd like me to. Uh, no, I don't think so, but Mr. Schultz? No, and I, I think we, as board members, we run into these issues a lot, too. Like, but I was the tax classification hearing I own a business in town, commercial property, and I own residential properties. I mean, I can't deliberate on that. So, I mean, you can take these things to the nth degree. I appreciate you bringing this before the board, but I have no problem with you being able to act fairly and in the town business, best interest. And, and the disclosures are on file, too. So that's that added step that's been taken. I don't have an issue with that. No, yeah, and again, the ultimate decision on the water tower in particular, uh, and even the communications uh, contracts, uh, really lie with it. It would come before the board anyway. It all comes pretty much from us. So. so if the consensus is there, Mr. Chairman, I'll... Please, I'll take a motion. I'll, I'll read one of the motions that we're prepared. Right. Pick one. Pick one. All right. I'll go with the top one. Sounds good to me. All right. Mr. Chairman, I move to determine that the financial interest of the town administrator in the following items as outlined in the attached disclosure forms is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the municipality may expect from the employee um, Tower Hill Water Tower site communication leases and equipment, Tower Hill Water Tower site long-term planning discussions, Tower Hill uh, Water Tower site and Middle High School property ministerial acts. Second. We have a motion and a second by Mr. Masseri. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, right on time. Uh, we are supposed to have a joint appointment with the CPC uh, for economic development, but we don't have a quorum since this evening, so we will push that off uh, to a future meeting. Uh, did we want to have a quick discussion, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, did we want to talk quickly about the other situation, or should we hold off on that? Uh, we can. I, I, 
brought it up to the chairman of the planning commission earlier this evening in relation to a joint meeting to interview candidates for the community planning commission vacancy uh, created by mr cody's um, moving out of town and resigning his position um, it's quite clear i mean we have a, an election two months away almost from the day yeah two months away and um, by the time we have the opportunity to interview jointly interview and then act on um, any candidates that would come forward to fill the unexpired term, which again, they would have to run for office again in less than two months. Um, I, I asked uh, Danielle, you know, how many meetings are the Planning Commission gonna have between say March 18th and, and I think you said two. You know, so basically we would be filling a vacancy uh, on the Community Planning Commission um, with an individual who would be attending two meetings and would still have to run for office and if other people were going to be running too, um, I guess I don't see it. The, the, the timeline associated with this is fairly short. And uh, I certainly wouldn't want it to be uh, discouraging anybody from running for the planning commission. Uh, it may be helpful to, to hear from people who may have an interest, um, but they still have to run. You know, so I, I would, you know, I also would not like necessarily have this board and the planning commission members who are left there um, having an undue influence on the voters in relation to people who are running for office and with such a short, short period of time right. before the vacancy is going to be. That was my concern. Is so, I don't want to leave that appearance that you know, we're dictating who we think would be the best to suit, sit in that position when the public should have that right uh, to, through the voting process. So uh, we feel pretty strongly that it would be beneficial if we did not jointly appoint anyone to fill the position for basically two meetings, and then allow and encourage the applicants to pull papers, go through the election process, and hopefully they'll be elected to the position for its remaining term. Well, actually, the term is expiring, right, for that spot, so it's for three years, it's a three-year term. Um, if you want an opportunity to say anything. Sure, thank, thank, you. thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I don't, uh, I don't have any disagreement with that. Um, it, 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 we, originally we had hopes to, um, when we found out that uh, Mr. Cody was going to leave, that he would process that paperwork a little quicker. So, and so we put the, everything in motion to do what we normally would do, and that is to appoint, so jointly appoint somebody. But it took a little time, and, and time did get away. So um, uh, we, we have no problem. We were just, the only, in, the only interest we had was being able to interview was to get some information out there to talk to some people and and if nothing else perhaps even generate a little competition for the for the um, uh, for the job because you know it's difficult to get volunteers and and uh, but I think that we do have some people I, I know the last time we, w we looked for volunteers we got uh, five of some of the best people I could ever imagine and we only needed one so there are some very qualified people out there so um, I, I look forward hopefully to getting that I mean, many again. You could hold, still continue to hold the meeting tomorrow night, but make it as a workshop where you could educate applicants on the CPC and the things you do and, and the processes so they have a full sure, sure. disclosure of the, what is involved in it um, and, and encourage more people besides these applicants to participate tomorrow night. It's at sure. 6.30, I believe, in this room. Um, yeah. And I think you should still do it for that That's, reason. It's too bad we couldn't, we, we, we can't put that on TV so we might get some people excited about what, what yeah. what's coming along you know but but uh, yeah I think that's I, I think we're in agreement with that okay so. I just think it's important mr. chairman that you know for the Planning Commission they, they play such an important role and, and sometimes it's not real visible but with all that's going on and uh, what we're looking for as far as meeting our, our potential you know on route 28 Caucus Street uh, we're talking about affordable housing and how we're going to fit it into our community. I mean, there's some very important issues that are sitting before them right now, uh, which you know are not on the back burner. They're on the front burner. Things are moving forward, and um, it's joint efforts between this board and that board are terrific. I haven't seen them this good in years, mm -hmm. and I think it's um, you know we all seem to be on the same page. It's an awful lot that's going to be happening going forward. There's going to be a lot of proposals. Uh, Put forth over the next two or three years mm -hmm. uh, that are going to have a significant impact on this community. And the Planning Commission is right smack dab in the middle of it, in the forefront of, of proposing these changes. So, um, 
please, you know, step forward. Yeah. Um, become a party to it and uh, offer your services. So awful lot going on. Just to continue that a little bit, you know, this board has a strategic plan and one of the number one priorities has been now that we've moved from water is now we're transitioning more into a focus on wastewater. Yeah. And we feel like we have a plan that's an actual plan that could be achieved mm -hmm. for the first time since the time I've sat on this board now nine years. Mm -hmm. And I've shown Mr. Larry and Mr. Messier have been here a lot longer. <laughs> so we actually have a plan and we need CPC to be part of that discussion. And think about what the community will look like with wastewater down Route 28. It's in without a strong CPC to manage that, yeah. we could already right. It, it, <laughs> we're excited about that as well. We, we really, um, we really look forward to working with the board and getting yeah. and getting getting our town moving forward and getting some economic development as a result of a of a sewer system. So we thank you for that. So we need more applicants. We need yes. more participation. We do. That would be great. Thank there's, you. For there's some work to be done. So now we're at the 7:30 hour and we're here for the most the the greatest time of the year as our department department. Uh, budget. budget hearings, so uh, we're going to get that started, and the first ones to go will have our CPC members, which you can stay right where you are if you'd like. Okay. We can have you run the presentation right from your seat. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. And if anyone would like to ask questions as we go through each of these budgets, uh, just Get recognized by me, state your name, and your address, and for the record, and feel free to ask your question. But please go through the chair for all questions. Before you get started, I just want to let you know, uh, Mr. Bellavance did reach out to the board to let him know that he had a long evening because of the snow, because of the snow he had to work a tremendous amount of hours, so he uh, wanted me to pass along his apologies for not being able to attend uh, to everyone at the board and you know, the CPC. Please continue. Sure. Just make sure I know how to change this. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, first. Right. Uh, first, I'll give an overview of the CPC's FY19 accomplishments and current projects. Uh, these in include a new townwide master plan, uh, transportation improvements, including projects funded by the Community Compact and Complete Streets programs, a new e-permitting program for development permits, um, completion of a housing production plan, and completion of new uh, planometrics for a GIS base map. Um, <coughs> as you know, our townwide master plan is currently underway. Work to date includes coordination with our consultant MAPC for a survey, three public forums, and a roundtable discussion in January for the four elected boards and committees, uh, which many of you attended. MAPC is currently working on the draft uh, plan, which will be presented to you and publicized for feedback before finalizing the plan early this summer. Transportation, um, the town's first complete streets project, a sidewalk construction project to fill the gap in the Haverhill Street sidewalk from North Street to Foley Drive was completed in early FY19 under the direction of the town engineer. Members of the CPC and other community members report frequent use of the sidewalk by pedestrians. Uh, the town's second complete streets project, speed recorders and speed re uh, reader feedback signs have also been installed and are being used now by the police department. Through a community compact grant award this year, we are looking at possible locations, potential ridership, and cost estimates for a park and ride shuttle program to help residents better access commuter rail stations in nearby towns. The town has contracted with MAPC's transportation planners for this work. A survey will be released early this month for residents and businesses, and a completed report with recommendations will be available by the end of the current fiscal year. Concepts for Route 28 improvements, such as improved sidewalks and lane reconfiguration, will continue to be discussed in the context of recent and future water and sewer decisions, so that decisions to change the physical street can happen in tandem. 
The town's first uh, housing production plan was completed and certified by the state in June 2018. The plan's recommendations include pursuing development of the 10-acre Carpenter Drive property for senior affordable housing, as well as seeking development of the parcels within the affordable housing overlay district, small sites scattered throughout residential neighborhoods throughout the town. We have recently reached out to the Mass Housing Partnership about technical assistance they can offer us in helping to determine what is feasible for the properties, both financially, considering subsidy programs available, and also considering their physical attributes. They can assist with RFP development, and we also anticipate receiving support in this area from our Regional Housing Services Office. The RHSO also continues to offer their support in helping to monitor our affordable housing inventory, strategizing preserving existing affordable units, and planning for new development. The planning department worked with the building department to submit a grant application to the Competitive Community Compact IT program for a new streamlined electronic permitting system <coughs> for the town. The town was successful in winning an $85,000 grant to pay for the system, including most of the department modules we want. The planning and building departments will continue to work closely to implement the program. Setup is to begin imminently and will include building, health, fire, planning, ZBA, and engineering and DPW. Additional funds to add the remaining modules are requested in the building department's budget with hopes of implementing them this summer. This will help further the town's goals of streamlined permitting, improved customer service, and support for new development. <coughs> Planometric development for a new GIS base map was completed in fall 2018. Using this information, the new, the new base map is currently under development by our GIS coordinator, Steve Letterman. We anticipate the completion of a demo site for internal vetting in early spring with public release of the new mapping program anticipated in late spring. Our FY20 goals and objectives. Um, this slide summarizes what we hope to achieve in the next fiscal year. We anticipate beginning the implementation, implementation of recommendations from the master plan. We are hopeful that the results of the sewer feasibility work being done currently will help inform our next steps with the master plan, resulting in the opportunity to make bold plans to improve Main Street. Through the master plan process, the CPC has heard many resident preferences for changes on Route 28. These, along with what is determined to be possible through wastewater infrastructure improvements and market conditions, will drive the CPC's planning activity in the near future. We expect to move forward with the Carpenter Drive RFP and development of senior affordable housing and possibly one or more of the affordable housing overlay district parcels. If funding is available, we would like to undertake the design of a new sidewalk for Central Street in hopes of leveraging additional complete streets funds in the future in support of our goal to make North Reading more walkable and safer for pedestrians. We will also be <coughs> Excuse me. We'll also be supporting the town's efforts in a new townwide facilities master plan. A new open space and recreation plan was funded at October 2018 town meeting, and we anticipate managing this project with the help of Parks and Recreation beginning this summer. Additionally, we will be looking to implement recommendations from the Park and Ride Feasibility Study currently underway, also to be completed early this summer. <coughs> Excuse me. Additionally, the EDC would like to continue working on the activities specified in its charge. The EDC currently ha still has $20,000 in its budget for the current year and does intend, uh, does intend to spend it. They have most recently be working, been working on concepts for tax incentive <coughs> programs, and once this is done, they would like to begin addressing other items in their charge. Activities, both for this and the next fiscal year, will include market analysis for commercial areas, um, outreach and technical assistance to commercial property owners, um, and various other activities that I've kind of listed on the slide here that we have um, been talking about with the EDC. Um, and then in terms of any real changes to the CPC budget this year, um, there's a modest increase of a few hundred dollars to the Housing Services Office fee, which does go up a little bit each year. Um, they've been a really valuable resource to us, um, so I'd really hope to continue that partnership. Um, as well as um, we've made a request to add back uh, $1,560 to our professional services budget, which had been cut a number of years ago, um, just in case things come up sometimes with consultants where a developer may not agree that something needs to be reevaluated, and we don't always need it, but we often find ourselves in a, in a situation where it would be helpful to ask for engineering consulting for those reasons. Um, so thank you, and I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Board members, any questions for Night. Yes, Ms. Minipelli. I don't have any questions. I just, I, I love to hear all the budget, budget presentations, but I also think it's a great opportunity for us to take and to congratulate you and acknowledge 
all of the things that you're doing for us. It's a tremendous amount of work, and you keep all the details so organized, and you have the answers that we need when we ask them. So I just want to say thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Your efforts don't go unnoticed, and they're a tremendous help to us when we wade through a lot of these things. Thanks very much. So their increase is five thousand dollars, and some of it is obviously labor contract changes, right? I think it's actually Personal less than that. Services. It's um, oh oh with the salary. Yes, right. that's true. Actually, and then yeah. you have your other request, which is less than two thousand dollars. Yeah. And can you just go over that again? What the sure. request is for, and I just I think it's important that the board understands. Um, did you did you mean the the salary? No. Nope. Or the just oh, the just the, the um, nineteen hundred dollars. <clears throat> yes. Um, so the 1918 is the increase over last year's budget, and that would reflect um, an increase of $358 for the Regional Housing Services Office. Um, the way that's calculated each year is we reevaluate um, the four participating communities um, in the office, um, use slightly different percentages of hours and so we try to keep it fair for example if Reading is Reading generally uses more hours than North Reading does so we don't pay as much so we, we evaluate it each year and we also allow for a modest increase to the um, the housing services office administrator who works in Reading and so that amounts to a slight increase for North Reading's portion of $358 um, <clears throat> and then the additional uh, 1560 for professional services is just um, for the CPC up until I think it was cut three years ago the CPC had had at its disposal um, an amount of money to be spent on professional services for engineering um, DCI is our on-call engineer that we have under contract most of the time their fees are hundred percent paid by the applicants um, sometimes there arises a dispute where we believe something needs to be looked at further um, and we need more hours from DCU than an applicant is willing to provide. It doesn't happen very often. We don't like it to happen because we don't think the town should be paying for that. Um, but every so often we do have a situation where we would like to have the flexibility to spend some of that money. <coughs> Additionally, looking at some of the projects that we're considering uh, moving forward on in this, the uh, next couple of years, having that uh, money available to us uh, might make it possible for us to get an engineering opinion that we might need to move forward in one of these projects. So it's not a great amount, but it is very useful when, it, when we need it. Mr. Chairman, I'm just concerned it may not be enough with all, this, with all that's going on and everything that's, that's being well, not just thrown at us, but what we're putting on our plate. Uh, and I don't think it's too much, and I think it's uh, very time sensitive. You know, my concern is that, you know, I mean, you can always go to the Finance Committee looking for some sort of a transfer for an unforeseen expense, but some of this is, we can see it, we can see it coming. And uh, my concern is that we're just shortchanging ourselves a little bit in our ability to uh, react on a timely basis to some of the situations that we that we have and some of the opportunities that we have. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, to Mrs. Megapelli's point, Danielle, and I think it, I try not to say, you know, what have you done for me lately? I mean, you've been doing a wonderful, wonderful job here for us, and uh, the grants and uh, everything that's been coming in and coming our way has been uh, so fruitful. Uh, and, and again, it doesn't go unnoticed, but it's, uh, by the same token, you need some resources to, to get things done, too, and you may need some outside assistance in order to facilitate some of these things. And timeliness for grant applications and programs that become available at the state level where an opportunity presents themselves, you know, I just would hate to... Uh, shortchange ourselves and if you think if you're being overly conservative in your estimates don't be shy because we won't be when we say no anyway but no, but, <laughs> but, 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 but truly if it's if, if you foresee a need you know let us know you know don't 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 hide it and uh, I mean I don't have a specific need that we've priced out where I could ask for a certain amount of money because while I certainly understand where, you know, we have the concern, I, I don't have a certain amount of money. But. Yeah, I, I am, um, and I appreciate the, your concern, Steve, and it is one that, <clears throat> it's one that, I've, that we've thought about a little bit, or I thought about it for a bit, but I think that probably that kind of funding would probably come with a proposal. In other words, if we had some, a project that we proposed that the funding for that would be, in, would be included in that proposal. This is more, this is uh, more for things that come upon us um, 
where we'd like to, we would need an answer right off in order to take advantage of a situation, or as Danielle stated, if we have an issue with a particular developer for some reason and we need to get an answer right off. So uh, that's so, that's sort of how where that money is uh, would, would go. So I had the same concern, and I stopped by Mr. McKnight's office this afternoon just to uh, go over that because I saw it, I read it, um, and I was concerned that it was a little low. And this board has shown a very big interest in potentially <coughs> finding a new solution for senior housing. Mm -hmm. And that's now. And we're going to get through this budget season, and then we're going to get back to that. I hope that this board will continue to keep moving forward on that discussion, and I think you have to be part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. So if your budget doesn't include your participation or whatever you think you may need to help support this board in that discussion, and I was thinking this line was that area, but if, mm -hmm. if you don't believe that's the right spot, then that's fine too. Well, with regard to the Carpenter Drive project, um, we do have resources available to us um, from the Housing Services Office. They have offered to help us with RFP development. We don't have unlimited hours from them, but they offer a good service and they have a good consultant on staff available to us, and we do already pay for that. So I don't, I'm don't. i not necessarily looking for an additional amount of money where we would need it for that project in particular. And we have also been looking into the Mass Housing Partnership offers technical assistance to towns, and I had a conversation with them a few days ago, and it's, it seemed, um, they, they really seemed um, amenable to helping us at this stage. This is kind of really what they do. So that project, um, I would struggle to justify asking for money for that project only because I don't know how much it would be. I'm not saying it wouldn't come up, but I, d I don't know if beyond those resources we would actually need anything in particular, which is why I've been reluctant to ask for any more. But Mr. Masir. <laughs> uh, I guess I look at it as uh, I believe they have goals set for FY 2020, and therefore the budget should be presented to cover achievement of those goals and I understand if you have something that you're working on that you can't nail down the numbers for uh, that might be a problem but you know it's a budget and uh, I think it's in the interest of the board that you achieve the goals you've set out for 2020 and have ample coverage financially to achieve those goals anyone else Mr. Yeah, it's not very often this board asks the department if you want more money. <laughs> so, um, but it's, I echo every, my colleague's sentiments. I mean, you, you make our job a lot easier, and you truly do, and you're professional what you do. Um, just if you had, know you're going to need something down the road, you know, it's better to ask for it now so we can plan for it, because we do know there's a lot of projects being thrown your way that are, are going to be coming in the next year or two. So I, I just, I know you're trying to make this as lean as possible, but Please don't sell yourself short if you know you have a project coming. That's all. Okay. We just want to align our strategic plan with your goals, and that's right. that's the most important thing at a time. <coughs> this has been your plan. So it looks like you what you you've requested, you've expended, and it looks like you're fairly precise in predicting that. This is just adding a little bit more to what you have already. Was what you what you made as a request, the 13000 a little bit over 13000 for things that are currently in the works that you're paying, or is that for what you anticipate for those goals over the next year? Um, well, the only items, I mean, so the, the increase to the professional services budget, um, so the professional service budget has in it um, money for the housing services office, and for the last few years, that has been all it's had. And we used to have 1,560 for sort of emergency um, on-call engineering services for our consultant. That was taken out a few years ago. My request was just to add it back in. I didn't have a particular additional project in mind where we, this was really just in case something should come up in the course of one of our development projects. With regard to the other projects that we have planned, I, I haven't been aware of a need for additional funds. The Carpenter Drive project, I, right now, if I sat down and calculated it, it's, it hopefully it would be zero to take us through the RFP development portion. But if you think it would be worthwhile to go back and look at those projects again for the coming fiscal year and try to look a little harder at, well, once we get past you know RFP development and other phases like that, if you think it might be helpful to add additional consulting money to support some of those things, I'm sure we could do that. Is, would, would that be your <coughs> preference? 
Well, I, I think it would be worth a discussion with the town administrator and yourself to get together and make sure okay. that they align. Sure. Okay. okay. And if you feel comfortable with the number, then you leave it alone. Okay. If you don't, then bring it back up and okay. you know, this process isn't over tonight. Sure. Okay. We're just getting started. So. Okay. Anything okay. else? For the Thank CBC. You. It's a great job, as always. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Youth services. And feel free to come right up here to the mic and sit down and be comfortable. Uh, we encourage it. And if, but if you feel more comfortable being up at the podium, you can do that as well. Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> yes. Do you want to just make a brief announcement regarding the library budget, or would you like me to? You can do that. So uh, for those who are looking at the agenda, we were anticipating reviewing the library's budget request this evening. Uh, however, we have a, a matter that we're uh, looking a little bit further into that may require an update to the budget, uh, particularly in the area of the budget for uh, covering the hours that occur seasonally outside of the regular business week. So the finance director, the library director, and I uh, spoke earlier today, uh, determined that it would uh, may not be the most productive use of everybody's time to have their budget presentation before we make those adjustments. So we will make those adjustments with a goal of presenting the budget here at the meeting on April 1st. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before we get started, I want to make sure, can everyone hear us okay? Good, everyone in the back can hear us. Thanks again. Well, folks at home, I assume, are hearing us well, too. Thank you. Budget book, it's fit page 54. If anyone's looking for it, go right ahead. Please introduce yourself yes. okay. so folks at home can hear. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ford. I'm the director of youth services here in North Reading. Um, thank you for your time and consideration tonight. I, I appreciate it. Um, at this time, I'm actually not asking for any budgetary changes, but I'd like to take the time uh, to tell you a little bit about the department. Um, I joined Youth Services last April 2018, so just under a year ago. Um, when I joined the department, I immediately um, appreciated the mission and the obvious efforts and commitment by all those involved. I also at that time um, immediately saw that there were some questions around maybe um, what the department did or who we served. Um, and I often had questions when I was out introducing myself. Um, so I immediately committed myself to trying to create some clarity around those questions. Uh, I did that. <coughs> By doing so, that led into many of my highlights. Um, so first of all, diversified and increased programming options. Um, my goal wasn't just to simply increase options. Obviously, I wanted to give kids more opportunity, but I also appreciate that it was all about giving youth a voice. So I asked both youth and their families kind of what their needs were, what their wants were, and then tried to respond to some of that. Um, I also tried to really have specific focus on a lot of my programming. A lot of the focus was around mental health, uh, building skills, <coughs> socialization, self-care, um, developing relationships, intergenerational relationships, and also just increasing um, kind of a sense of community overall. Uh, my next was facilitating partnerships. I have always recognized that the key to success is partnerships. There were already several partnerships in place, uh, but many of the ones that I feel have increased are um, the Flint Memorial Library, the high school, um, NORCAM, and again, I've been very committed to creating those partnerships and I continue to be moving forward. Um, talking about bridging gaps, uh, as I mentioned, I was, um, I've spent time trying to develop intergenerational relationships. Obviously, uh, the most obvious is between youth and seniors. They are two of the highest risk populations. <coughs> 
Uh, so trying to bridge some of those gaps. That wasn't my only focus. I also tried to bridge some of the gaps between uh, even just middle school and high schoolers, uh, parents and kids, um, town departments, the school department and the town. Um, again, the key to success is cohesiveness and I, I definitely am trying to encourage that. Um, I was very fortunate. Kim Brown, the media specialist at the middle school high school, um, invited me to co-direct Maker Blocks. Maker Blocks are basically, um, for lack of better words, study halls at the high school. Uh, those, those sessions in, included anything from arts and crafts to making food, uh, robotics, anything. And she had invited me to facilitate those, which gave me a great opportunity to interact with the high schoolers that I otherwise wouldn't have. Um, I also, obviously, as a new employee, or I had, um, it was very important for me to get my face out there and introduce myself to the town. In those efforts, I attended um, many, many town events, whether it was National Night Out, Apple Fest, school events, um, also statewide, uh, the youth services directors meetings. They have statewide, so I would attend those as well to share ideas with other directors and also gain some of their knowledge. And then nationwide, I was very fortunate to be invited by the former youth services director. She's now the um, DFC grant coordinator, uh, director, excuse me, Amy Luckowitz. She had invited me last year to the CADCA mid-year training in Florida. Uh, I would say empowering the youth is one of my biggest goals and the thing that I'm very, very committed to. Um, I would say some of the best examples of that is um, some of the programming, Dungeons and Dragons being one of them. Uh, it's not just about thinking outside of the box and offering a program that the kids are invested in, but it was inviting them the opportunity to facilitate it. I simply supervise. They are the ones who lead it, they create it, and I firmly believe that with that comes leadership skills, um, creativity. There's a wealth of benefits to having them facilitate. I also um, created a fifth grade girls group, uh, recognizing again, it was all about empowering and hoping that instilling tolerance and acceptance at a very young age will carry them through middle school, high school, and onward into life. Um, at this point, we've already exceeded the FY18 enrollment, and I only um, anticipate seeing that continue. So, I'm far more comfortable talking about my goals versus my accomplishments. My goals, to diversify funding sources. Um, aside from the obvious pursuing grants and donations, I um, have an idea that is in its infancy stage. Um, it basically is a youth services store. What that would entail, it would be youth driven, uh, created and managed with youth and volunteers. The community would be asked to make donations and those donations would be sold at um, a discounted cost. And all of the proceeds would then go back to the department. This idea, I, re I appreciate, is thinking outside of the box a bit, um, but there's multiple levels of benefits to this. The obvious economical, it provides an economical option to local families. Um, Skill building is off the charts, the opportunity for that. Again, it's introducing youth to budgeting, to management, to marketing. Um, I mean, they're endless. And then from an environmental standpoint, it's encouraging people to donate and give back versus disposing of things and uh, ending up in landfills. To be very clear, this store wouldn't be about selling trash. Uh, they would be a very selective as far as donations coming in because I also um, am very aware of the cost that could be incurred by bringing in things that we then had to dispose of. Um, on a smaller scale, um, we're, I'm even entertaining the idea of maybe doing something with prom gowns this spring to start with that and kind of see how that goes and then move you know, on. Again, this is in the infancy stage. Um, there is a local social enterprise that's very successful in Boston called More Than Words, and it is literally at-risk youth running and managing a bookstore in, um, in Boston. And they are used as a national example of a successful social enterprise. So it, it works. It's just having the infrastructure to make it work. Um, were you going to ask a question? I won't, just while we're on the topic. Yeah. Would okay. that be? 
food items or clothing items or electronic equipment? I would. Where? Where, where were you envisioning that? And, and that's the, the that's the first thing yeah. is finding a space. And obviously, when it comes to town space, that's <laughs> limited, if not non-existent. Um, so that's really the first barrier that I need to get over. And um, again, I've had this idea for a while. There were other things I need to kind of get into place before I could take on this endeavor. And you know, there are other concerns as well. You know, I'm a a team of one at this point. So to have to be very realistic on what this could look like. Again, I have no doubt the potential success of it and the revenue it could generate, but it just, I have to also be very realistic on make, being able to make it come to fruition. So uh, to answer your question, I wouldn't say food. I mean, I have considered maybe if we did some sort of a partnership with the food pantry, but I, I would say more housewares, um, furniture. Um, the reality is we all know it. People, you know, have a beautiful living room. They're redecorating a year later. They have a couch that has been sat on three times, and now they're looking for a new home. I feel like we live in a community who would jump at the opportunity to donate things like this, knowing that it was then going back to the youth in their community. Does that answer your question at all? Okay. Um, so the next one, award youth services graduating senior lottery. It's exactly what it's called. So basically what um, that idea is, is um, it would be for graduating seniors. The only criteria for eligibility would be participation in youth services. Uh, basically they would be put into a lottery for every, every time that they participated in youth services, they'd be put in for a lottery. The only criteria would be uh, they would have to participate in youth services every quarter for their high school career. Obviously if we put this into the academic year of next year, those seniors would only be eligible for that senior year. It would take four years for next year's freshmen for the, us to be able to hold them for the four years throughout. Um, but literally, every time you participate in the youth services program, you increase your chances and it's literally just pick of a draw and they get a scholarship or a lottery. Um, to enhance programming and hone existing series, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, Again, as a, as a new director in implementing new programming, you know, everything is trial and error. Uh, you know, sometimes what we think is gonna be great bombs, and then something that we think was just kind of a filler ends up being fantastic. So this year I'm really excited about really being able to identify and really enhance those that seem to be successful and I anticipate being successful. In one example, um, the whitewater rafting trip had the privilege of going twice last year, both with middle school and high school. Uh, it was amazing. Um, I would like to expand that to encompass um, for the youth to be involved from square one, so they would be part of creating a budget, <coughs> creating a shopping list, going shopping, uh, meal prep. There would be leadership activities while we were away. So it would just be an opportunity. We're bringing youth together just a, another opportunity to gain some more skills. Um, and then expanding social media presence. We all know social media is it. Uh, I'm very fortunate and I'm excited to tell you that it's already kind of happening. Um, Danielle Masterson, Director of Youth Services at Flint Memorial Library has joined our Youth Services Committee and she was very gracious to offer some support in this area and we're already seeing the benefits of that. So to circle back to the questions of clarity, this department was built on voice. A group of concerned parents identified a problem and used their voice and actions to solve it. The best way, or the best thing we can do to serve our youth is to create a community where everyone belongs and to give them the, school, the tools and skills to build that community. Everything I do has that vision in mind. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Just continue to keep doing a great job, and it certainly has uh, been welcomed in the community, and I think people would be sad to see if us ever let it go. So please continue to keep growing. Thank yep. you. And just to let you know, I love that the youth service is Facebook. It's great. Um, I, I think it's a great use of Facebook for us old dinosaurs that are on Facebook. Whoa, whoa. I know the kids aren't the kids aren't on Facebook, but 
it's a great way for our parents or us to keep connected with what is going on. It's uplifting. It, I love Danielle. Everything Danielle posts yeah. too is so uplifting. And it's also informative. So I think it's a great use. And also to just acknowledge, I see yes. your your committee there that's always here to support you. And I know they're, help, they're a big helping guide. And you sure with what you're doing and trying to help get you connected with what you need to get done too. So. So just to acknowledge them too. Thank you. The store, do you have a timeline? If best case scenario, what would be the time frame you would love to have a space available? Uh, Next year, this year? Yeah, I mean, I, I would think that um, the summer's always, I, maybe not to kick it off, but maybe if I could start really working out some of the details over the summer and then thinking maybe if I had the space by next fall then to maybe implement at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, Any questions? other questions? John? Thank you, John. Thank you. Next we have code enforcement. That's on one page 164 of the budget book. Okay. You have a different budget book then. That's last year's. No, it is <laughs> Does anybody want a hot coffee? Yo. My answer is you should probably get them. Thank you. Good evening. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Jerry Noel. I'm the building commissioner, uh, of course, here in North Reading. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to basically present this to the Finance Committee and the Select Board. You see, this is my first bit. Well, so tonight I'll be speaking about the following subject, which my my presentation over: <coughs> Building Department's mission, notable <laughs> achievements performance and workload indicators, FY20 budget and statement, FY20 small capital request, and FY20 goals and objectives. The building department's mission. The building department's mission is to protect the lives and safety of the residents and visitors and businesses with implementation of proper construction methods relative to Massachusetts State Building Code regarding all disciplines for roughly 6,300 structures in the town. Building codes and zoning bylaws are promulgated for the purpose of protecting the public's health, safety, and welfare. Notable accomplishments and growth for 2018. The building department was able to ensure successful groundbreaking of the new Pulte project, Martin's Landing. By that, I, <clears throat> excuse me, by that we, uh, I mean we're, we are successful with Martin's Landing Project without having any delays, and they were able, we were able to meet their needs. Um, we manage permitting software. With this, we had, we had a team, meaning a safety, safety director, fire, health, and building department were collaboratively interviewing 
software vendors that can support all departments in town and interface with Munis. And I'd be remiss if I did not, uh, if I did not include uh, the town planner, who was, who was very instrumental in, in, in securing us. She also was able to secure a, a $85,000 <coughs> um, grant for us for this out of the 102, so there's still $17,000 left for that, but I want to speak about that further in. Um, conducted an analysis of perm uh, permit fees for communities similar in size to North Reading to establish a consistent permit fee base. The reason why I did this is I'm really trying to support my budget. Um, and, and I feel this presentation, this presentation around the permit fees should support it. Drafted new residential and commercial permitting. This is a checklist that I attach to all the, I attach all the billing permits in online that allow the applicants to see what we need and process their apl applications in an efficient manner. It's, a, oh, it does, you have to do 671. I think you may have in a hard copy of uh, FinCom, anybody who's in the hard copy, it, should, it says issue 671 building permits. I think you may have 667 unintentionally. How many was it? 671. <clears throat> I just wanted to be green. I didn't want to waste. Uh, okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. So, uh, Chair, how many of that 671 was related to Pulte? Do you, if you could. 100. 100. Okay. 100. So we were and still up. We take Pulte yeah, out. We're still and up. I'll be getting. I'll be getting into that further further into the presentation. But good question. Um, so we issued, so which is 36% more than 2017. Um, you will see as I go through the presentation um, and the charts, which will show relative to the growth. Um, assisted in development of public safety team inspections. Um, what I mean by that is the building department and fire, health, public safety director, and the team work together to better assist the community with issues that arise weekly. I have worked in other communities. And truly, I, I, I haven't had this type of support um, with everybody getting together and, and going to these places such as uh, sanitation, uh, uh, a house that doesn't, uh, that doesn't have a roof that's basically ready to cave in, and the health department and the building department and the fire department get together and we go over there and we basically get the means for these people to, to be able to, to stay living in this place. Of course, it's not fit for human habitation at that point in time, but we'll get it to that point, and very, very fortunate. Performance, performance? Excuse me, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question concerning um, conducted an analysis of permit fees for communities similar. Has that analysis been completed? It has been completed, and I really, and I have all, I have some of it here, and I have that in the back of your packet. But I really don't want to give you that now because I don't want that to interrupt what I plan on telling fine. you on this. <clears throat> or would you like to have it now? Nope, it's fine. Nope, okay. Performance workload indicators. The building department consists of one full time uh, time assistant. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't move on. The building department consists of one full time assistant administrator, one, one part time building inspector, three part time plumbing inspectors two part-time electrical inspectors, one weights and measures inspector, and one full-time building commissioner. And the rest, as you see, is fairly ancillary, just it pretty much talks about the town. This next, is, this next chart here is basically what Mr. Schultz asked um, relative to <coughs> Pulte, or should I say Martin's Lynn. This, is, this chart shows without Martin's Land, 571 building permits issued, 57 HVAC permits issued. Um, just so you know, the building inspector inspects the HVAC units and the buildings. So there's three inspections for the HVAC, and if it's a new, new construction, there's seven for the building. So <coughs> it's, it's quite intense. Then we have the ele electrical inspections, plumbing, gas, and so on. That's, that's just um, the chart without Poldy.
as you can see right here, this chart shows is an increase of 79 permits, 16 percent more issued permits. This shows you the full chart showing everything. The 36 percent shows building, the 6 percent shows HVAC. So that leaves 42 percent of the burden on the building inspector themselves. Um, 25 percent electrical, 20 percent plumbing, and, and uh, 13 percent gas, which is, if you add that up, the plumbing and a gas inspector are the same, and that's 33 percent. Go to the next shot. This is just building permits only, and it basically shows you from 2017, an analysis from 2017 issued 492 permits, 2018 permits issued was 671. That's an increase of 179 permits, 36 percent issued permits. We go to the next permit breakdown, which basically shows the, the permit breakdown by discipline, 2017, 2018. What I mean by discipline, I mean by labor trades. You basically, you can see, see for yourself right across the board, 2017, 2018, 671, 494, electrical, 424, 473, and it just pretty much goes on. These are inspections. Inspections for 2017 versus inspections for 2018. You'll see the inspections for 2017 were 1,022. The building inspections for, for 2018 were 1,459. Electrical, 1,410. And then once again, 2018, the electrical is 1,513. To expound a little bit in that 1,513, it doesn't look like that mu that's much of a number, 103. But 103 is quite a bit especially when you have failed inspections and you have to go back. If it's a new house, you're looking at three, if not four, inspections. Um, plumbing, 465. And if you look at 2018, plumbing went up to 945. It's huge, huge. Gas, 291. Gas, 502. It just goes to show you the, the amount, of, amount of support we need. HVAC permits, 24. 2018, we did 206. Remember, the building department inspects those. The inspector, not the electrical inspector, not the plumbing, the building inspector. Projection of permitting for calendar year 2019. If you look at this, this is my projection. And the reason why that is my projection is if on, a, on, on, our, on our budgeted items, we have Elm Street, which, seven, which is going to be seven house, house lots. <coughs> we have Shea Lane, which is going to be ten house lots. Eaton Circle, seven house lots. Nickel Street, five house lots. Charles Street, ten house lots coming. Uh, that's a potential of 39 new homes. We have 25 new homes that came on this past year. Um, we have 35 Main Street. I don't have to tell you, you ride up and down that street, you see the amount of, the, the amount of work being done there. Um, we have a large amount of uh, work going on at 100, 200, and 300 uh, Riverside Park Drive. I can't tell you the amount of permits and the amount of uh, plan review I have to do. Some of them are taking me three and four days just for plan review for 100, 200, 300, 400 River Riverside Park Drive. It's, it's, it's quite a bit. Um, and if you include the 40B project, which is going to be coming in January of, uh, uh, I would say, 2020, um, if it does come to fruition, uh, that puts a lot of burden on a building department, huge burden. Um, so that basically, I just wanted to basically expound on, on the projection of the permitting for, the, for that calendar year. Any questions on that or? No? Oh, okay. Uh, permit fees. 324,635 plus Martin's Landing, of, which is 410,000. That was $86,000. To date, from, from July 2019, we have 305,000. 
Of course, that's inclusive of Pulte in there as well. Do you have a projection what you think it'll end up at? What I think this is going to end up at? Um, I yeah. think I think it's going to be over 500,000. And if we go with the, if you go with the 32% increase in permit fees, which we haven't increased our permit fees in, I think it's 12, 12 or 15 years. Uh, the previous, yeah, the previous building commissioner couldn't really give me an exact, he couldn't put his thumb exactly on it, but he thinks it's between 12 and 15 years. Um, and that, that would basically easily support that. And you're looking at 30, just say an even 30%, $500,000. It doesn't take a mathematician to figure that out. That's $650,000. So that should easily support my budget that I'm asking for. So um, so a budget statement in, in uh, FY20, uh, budget reflects the needs to meet the growing needs of the community. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> growing needs of the community. We will continue to protect the lives and the safety of all in town hall in, uh, through implementation Town, I'm sorry, Town of Reading, through infl implementation of proper construction methods in accordance with Massachusetts State Building Codes. The budget proposal reflects an increase of $127,567. 17,000 of that is basic, that should say 41%, not 48%, because 17,000 of that is basically for the permitting software. And the permitting software, you're going to have the building, you're going to have fire, you're going to have uh, uh, planning. Uh, you're going to have DPW. Everybody's going to be using that, but we lumped it into one area, and, and that area was building department. So, so, Mr. Messeri, do you have a question? Yes. What is that software? That software is is it's called Permitize. It's called Permitize, and and what they have is they basically have a, a permitting which starts at the building department, and and we're able to do our do our proper planning, put our permits in. Um, and and what it does, it it basically adds credence to to what we do, and and and, and it gives a clear view for everybody. So there's so there's um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't. The the word eludes me. <laughs> but are there are there any local communities using that software now? Uh, Ipswich used it. Ipswich was uh, Ipswich is uh, uh, floored with it. Um, Danvers uses it. Uh, Quincy just just dropped uh, their software company. I'm really not going to say who it is. I don't know if it's if it's good to say on there, but they just dropped theirs. This is Quincy, Mass, and they they have taken on Permitize, and it's one of the reasons why why I, I think we all felt that it was a a great fit for the town. Um, have you been in communication with our IT department, Mark? And yes. Yeah. Okay. They like. They like it as well. They they basically were were, were in on the full uh, vendor selection. Thank you. Thank you. Budget statement. Uh, so with this, I, as you can see, I'm looking for a full time a full time inspector. Right now, the current inspector works 26 hours a week. It's just uh, really difficult with these economic de de demands, the current economic demands, to, to continue working 26 hours a week. I'm having a hard time getting out of the office and even performing inspections uh, because there's just so much work, so much plan review, so much work on, uh, uh, right now, audit, audit is a correction. Um, going out with the, you know, with the team, looking at different things. Um, so it, it's the reason why I'm looking for this, because we are going to be increasing our workload um, by almost 30 percent. That's, that's huge. That's huge. And, uh, and the only people that are going to suffer from this are going to be the applicants, whether it be the contractors or whether it be the residents here in town. You're going to suffer from services. The, the, the service that we currently provide is, is going to be lax. Um, and if that's what I'm looking for. I'm, lo I'm looking to try to get that, you know, within the budget, and that's the first inspector salary, and which is the sixty-four thousand dollars. And as you come further down, you look at the eighteen thousand, and you look at them both within the plumbing and the electrical, and you're saying, "Geez, why did he put that in the plumbing and electrical?" Well, as I explained earlier, we're going to have thirty-nine new houses, plus we have all this other other work coming on board, plus we also have the forty B, which is which is basically on our doorstep. Uh, and we still have Pulte in town. So for at least the next two years, I'm going to need some help. 
and I'm hoping it's going to be in the form of this help right here. Um, and then we have the small capital, capital, which is another big, big hit, which is $17,000. I think I already expounded on that, which is basically <coughs> explaining that $17,000 in my budget in order to support the, the, the permitting software. Any questions? Mr. Masseria. Are you planning to add new people or extend the part-time hours? I would. What I'd like to do is the current inspector, I'd like to uh, bring him down to 16 hours a week, which he is for, but I think he may rather do a per diem, um, and hire a full-time inspector at 35 hours a week to not only help with inspections, but to help with plan, plan review, to help with 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 uh, uh, the zoning, the help with everything. Does that help answer your question? So you you're adding one. New correct. Full -time correct. Employee. Yeah. Okay. Reducing that the hours my question. Down. for the current for the current inspector. <coughs> correct. Sixteen hours. Sixteen hours and, and or per diem. Yep. And then bring in a full time. Correct. To assist you. Yeah. Okay. Small capital projects. Ooh. Building department is requesting funds to implement electronic permitting software that will allow more efficient communication. I think we already discussed this, so if you want to continue, me to continue reading it, that's the $85,000 that um, uh, the town planner, Danielle, was able to secure. Um, and we have uh, that outstanding $17,000, which uh, re we are requesting with that small capital, capital re request, and it's $102,000 for the permitting software. Okay. Is there an annual fee to run that permit? There is. There is. And I think the annual fee town wide is going to be around, if I remember correctly, I think it's going to be. I have to get back to you on that. I forgot. It was on the tip of my. I have to get back to you on that. Annual fee on Okay. Yeah, this is. The this is annual support fees for the permitting software is shown in the IT budget. And it's approximately 17000 It's very close to the amount that uh, Jerry needs for the remaining. Exactly. So when we look at, if we're going to have a discussion about fees, we need to make sure that's wrapped into the revenue of fees, right? To capture that cost. Yes, and just for one point of clarification, the 17330 that was remaining for the permitting software is going to be requested as a warrant article. It is not part of the code enforcement budget. Okay. So it's outside of capital. <coughs> it's small capital, but it will be a special warrant article. Okay. <laughs> the other question I have was, was there a reason why we waited 12 years to raise rates on a is that typical? And that's a good question. And shame on me because I, I never even thought of it twice about it. But I'll, I'll speak on this in two minutes here. Liz, I don't know if I brought enough, so I'll get back to you. Yeah. 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 No? No. What is it you're handing out here, Jerry? These are the, what you see in the white pages. <laughs> the current fee systems that we, that the town has. What you have in the blue pages are what I am proposing. Oh, you can hold on to that. <laughs> so I assume you did some comparison with surrounding towns to see if we're in the ballpark. Yeah, oh, absolutely. If you look up, I did. I uh, this this took me about, I would say, close to a month of just uh, uh, with an incredible amount of interruption. I, I basically did this on weekends, and it just went back and forth, back and forth. Slowly started plugging numbers in, try to figure out ways of how we could determine this. Um, and there, there are so many different variables that in, in order to hit every single line item that every, every town has, you, you'll be looking at an eight to 10 week project full time. So you can see the first line is Andover. 
application fee, $25. Costs per thousand, 13. That's what they charge for every thousand dollars, they charge $13. Minimum fee is $25 for the application fee. And then, uh, uh, I, mean, mi I mean, sorry, minimum fee again, $25. Then a minimum application fee of $25. <coughs> Cost per thousand, and the commercial end is $13. $13. And you see the minimum fee at the end once again. And if you look down, you'll basically see, see all that. I'm, uh, what I show is in the red, which is the proposed. I spoke with the new commissioner in, in Reading. He loves the way how, how I put this together. He loves how I put this together. He wants to know if I could email this to him so he could basically work with it, because he feels his fees are low. And if you look at his fees in Reading, he's at $11, I'm sitting at 12. Um, and if you look at his in North Reading, I'm proposing 13, he's at 12. He feels he should be at 14. I think it might be a little high. Um, but I, I, I want to make this as business friendly as I possibly can, but I also want to make sure that the, that the town is, is, is able to uh, provide the service, pr provide the services to the people and to the contracts. Uh, on contractors and to the residents by means of an increase such as this. Um, so if you go through that, it's, it, it's quite comprehensive. So it, it, it's not going to take minutes to go through that. It's going to take quite a while. I don't know if you have any questions about it. but <clears throat> So, Mr. Gilbert, what's the process to change fees? <clears throat> so we would likely take this and maybe boil it down to what the, um, the current fee structure is and what the proposed fee structure is, review that with the board. Uh, my intention was to take that and review it as part of our, um, our, our budget, budget closeout and reconciliation process, so sometime in April, uh, probably that April 22nd meeting where we would show that um, as a, a, a change to be made, um, most likely effective July 1st. Okay. So I have uh, goals and objectives. Full implementation of new permitting software for accuracy, timeliness, proficiency, and transparency. Uh, Liz and I have talked many times about transparency, and uh, I think we need that desperately. Um, and, and when I was hired originally, uh, this was one of my this was one of my goals, and I had uh, I remember telling uh, <coughs> I remember telling Mike, and I told Bob, I said this is this is my forte. I wanna I wanna make sure that when bringing the town into the, uh, the building department in 21st century. Oh, go right ahead. The software that you're proposing um, for the town, does that have to, let's say I would want to look up a plan that was submitted related to Pulte or the 40B, do I have the ability to access? In the future, you them? will have the ability to do that. That is correct. Okay. You will have that ability. So anybody that applies for a permit, it'll be held on or stored there so Correct. that anyone else yep. can look at it. You'll always have that ability. From from that point forward, you're always going to have that ability to see whatever it is that you that, that you need um, or that you're looking for from that point forward. Uh, but we'd have to pay an additional fee in order to get uh, all our history put okay. in there. Oh, yeah. So in applying for a fee, it would be an online through the software, or is it still a paper uh, application? Let I mean, in apply, applying for a permit, let's Apl say some of those would require paperwork to apply for. Applying for a permit is going to be everything is going to be online. We're going to try to make it as user friendly as possible. Uh, the first six six to seven months is 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 going to be difficult. It's going to be grueling, especially on. Uh, on, on uh, Kathy, administrative assistant, it's going to be extremely difficult for her. She's going to have a lot of, a lot of additional work, um, and I'm, I'm going to try to help her. And it's another reason why we, I, I feel we need to have more, at least one more person to help, to help all this process out and to help streamline. But that's just initially until it's implemented fully, and then it should reduce workload. No, to a certain degree, it will reduce workload. Absolutely, but, uh, but our. Econo but our economy is still on fire. It is still oh, yeah. strong. So it doesn't mean we can't look down the road and say, hey, we need to reduce this down the road. I don't have an issue with that. But for the time being, I, I need help now. <coughs> um, I understand. And just to make, ask a couple questions about the problem. Yeah, okay. So 
I assume now today, if the deputy fire chief needed to come in and get a drawing, he'd have to come into town hall, print it. Is that the step he would Pretty do? much, correct. Physically yeah. have to touch the paper, bring the paper. But that going is correct. forward with this, he could just take a tablet now, get on site. Take a tablet. In. If you have a big screen like this, you can look, he, he can look at it right on his, right on his screen in his office. And, and it, it saves all those steps. It saves all that time. So it saves time for everybody in town. Everybody. But he can even do on the site. He can go on site now, wherever he is, log in. Correct. If, if someone has a question, he can pull up all these drawings and get everything real time. That is correct. Yeah, that, that's priceless. That's yeah. great. So um, okay. then I'm, I'm looking to be uh, as cost effective and maximize, uh, maximize staff efficiency. And that's, that, that's all part of this process. Sure. To create a multidisciplinary approach to streamline the permitting process between multiple departments, including finance. Um, and basically, uh, I guess that's <clears throat> um, finalize written procedures to maximize and utilize staff time. Uh, the billing department doesn't really have, has never had any type of uh, procedures written up. And uh, when I first got, in, uh, got over there, I basically asked Kathy, uh, uh, can you give me the written procedures of how the how the building department should be should work? How it should how how it should operate? And she kind of looked and chuckled and said, "We don't have anything any, any such thing." So I need, uh, so I, I need to put something together for this to basically have show how the building department should function and show the amount of time it should take to secure a permit and and on and on. It, uh, there's a there's an awful lot. There's it's probably going to be a booklet that's going to be 30, 40 pages, but it's it's quite a bit. Um, increased department uh, <coughs> capabilities proportionally to the growth and the need within the community. Um, and hopefully that's with, with getting the help. Uh, even if it's temporary for a year and a half, two years, uh, and, it, and it goes once again with the economic conditions, it is what it is. Implement a more modern fee schedule to increase town revenue for community permitting needs. And that's what I just passed out to you. <coughs> so any questions relative to what I just... Uh, Laid out, or Mr. Schultz? Yeah, uh, Jerry. As far as if we were able to get that software, what would be the plan for? I, I imagine we'd be using it going forward. Obviously, what would be the plan for uh, inputting all the old plans and the old, you know, the older stuff? Well, we don't have system. a plan right now to implement all old plans um, into this actual system. We would have to pay a a separate fee, unless there was a way for IT to basically find a way to be able to do that. I I, I don't know. How they would do that, um, I do know the last the, uh, the last place I uh, municipality I did work, we we did that. We basically paid them a fee to come in and to uh, download all those, and it was it was it was quite quite comprehensive. So your plan right now would be just using moving forward, moving forward. But I would like to in the future get everything in get everything on the system. Um, it, we also have. Uh, <coughs> We also have, have the seniors coming in, and we have, we have them scanning all the plans. We have them scanning all the building plans because we want to be able to have everybody see everything. Ah, you know, as I mentioned before, in, in one of these it says transparency. I, I want to be as transparent as possible, and it's one of, you know, I'm right out there. There's, there's, there's no reason why we shouldn't be. Is there a, a timeline you can go back or you do it all? I don't know if there's a timeline. It's a good question. I'd have to, I'd have to get back Just to you on to me, that. It, it that you know, there's got to be sort of a line in the sand of going all the way back. May not. Oh no, no. I don't want to go back to 1947 okay. and yeah, uh, you know, it's at zoning. Be, yeah, no. I don't, I, I don't want to go over there, that far back. I, I would say maybe 10, 15, 20 years. You know, so. Mr. Masseri. It sounds like you've had direct experience with the software you're proposing and not. Like not it. this software. Not this software. I've had I've had direct experience with uh, two other softwares. Um, one of them was out in Marlboro. Uh, um, uh, unfortunately, I had to bring it in, and I uh, I wasn't in favor of it. it um, the mayor was in in favor of it, and uh, it's a terrible software. They they basically are looking to jump ship on this software, and that was that was four years uh, three and a half four years ago. Um, the previous community where I, where, where I was, they had uh, 
uh, Permit Pro. Permit Pro is a great software. It, it, there's nothing wrong with it. The problem is, is the support that, that is lax. Um, Permit Pro only has one person that basically oversees everything. That one person goes on vacation, what do you do? That one person gets into uh, an accident, God forbid, what do you do? At least over Permit Eyes, they have a whole, they have a whole uh, department that basically oversees this. Okay. Anyone else? Stolen. Yeah, obviously, I think the investment uh, of $17,000 for a $102,000 software program is, a, is sort of a no-brainer. It will bring us to the well, current century uh, as far as uh, you know, what we have for records and how we maintain them and all the rest. So, I mean, it, it's a, a good investment, and if it's going to cost us $17,000 a year to maintain the program, so be it. Uh, it would appear that the, uh, the efficiencies that it's going to be generated from it should, should more than cover the cost as well as uh, have the availability of, of you know, the permits on the, on the properties from uh, years past. I mean, certainly for fire and uh, even the building department and electrical inspectors and stuff, they'll be able to look back and see what, what's in these buildings. You know, what are the right. need for upgrades Absolutely. is going to be huge. So, I mean, so that, that's a no-brainer. I, I don't know why it's a separate warrant article. Liz, why would that be a separate warrant article instead of uh, included in inspection services? Or well, we you're deferring to the town administrator? <laughs> we, we currently have 85000 if I don't mind speaking. We currently have $85,000 on a grant for that. So the separate uh, uh, small capital is seventeen thousand dollars. Right, but right. Oh, I see what your question. I mean, I think the thinking is that the project is a type of project that would have otherwise been submitted as a warrant article and funded as a warrant article. We were able to identify a third party funding source uh, through grants that offset a significant chunk of it, but that the balance would re remain as a warrant article. Um, similar to a number of different initiatives that have come out of the planning department. But we can look at funding it in a separate fashion. I'm just uh, curious. And, and, and the good part about it is the, 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 the departments are gonna, that are going to benefit from that are going to be building, border health, fire, DPW, planning, ZBA. No, no, it's and, yeah. and it's going to be munis linked. Yeah, no, that's, that's terrific. But in relation to your other proposals uh, here, uh, as far as uh, needed uh, assistance and manpower, it's rather obvious in relation to the, the level of, uh, of construction, reconstruction that's taking place uh, in our community, and again, what is, uh, not just potentially, but what is ongoing already. And again, you know, I, I thought that some resources from Pulte, first of all, were going to be dedicated towards inspectional services, have we, in code enforcement. Have we done that? Is that truly reflective of the demands? Isn't it, wouldn't it be obviously you know, the building inspectors, you know, time and effort and energy and spent on it is what it's included in the regular budget, but it's above and beyond the normal course of business. This is a one-time project. Uh, so are we? Are, are all the permitting fees going into this revolving fund, or just a portion of it? It's just for Bolton. I know we it's don't just have one for all. No, no, no okay. That, that, that's fine. So now as far as the increase in um, non um uh, development and permitting, um, is the administration, I know you're not making a recommendation tonight, acknowledging the, the workload, significance of the workload, and the potential need for additional help? Yes, I mean, I, I believe that there is a need for assistance in the building department. Uh, if, if whether or not we're able to provide it at the level that it's been requested today is a, an issue that we'll have to deal with going through the budget reconciliation uh, process <coughs> in April. Um, the the Pulte resources are obviously something that are available to try to assist us. We're obviously trying to balance that with how much of the workload is Pulte related versus what isn't, and what is a, a plan that will address the need 
for the next few years, but maybe not necessarily beyond that if it's not needed. So that's the balance. That's that's a struggle that we face right now, I think. And, and again, I think you know the the pulse of revenue certainly um, would enhance our ability to respond to all of the the needs of the community, code enforcement, the building, the special services department. <clears throat> um, and again, if we need seed money to assist in doing that until we raise the fees to support the system, I would hope that we would do that. In other words, it appears as though the seed money would be there through the Pulte revenue to help start to fund the uh, department appropriately until the revenue from the fee schedule actually gets, uh, gets appropriated of the cost. Well, based on the, st the statistics that you provided, is the Pulte is only a quarter of your your um, <coughs> quantity of permits. Right, but so the revenue source, but the, but the not revenue even a source, not from even a quarter. timing standpoint, <coughs> it's coming in now. The revenue source for increase in permit fees is going to be more of a trickle effect rather than the influx of cash now coming from, from Pulte. And I'm saying, you know, utilize that in order to staff up to the level we need now, rather than trying to match the revenue sources. And, and you don't get ahead that way, particularly with the initiative that's, that's yeah. going to be undertaken with this new software and getting it up. So that, that in and of itself, based upon the goals that were just stated, it's going to take a significant amount of uh, human resources uh, within the department to get it up and running. And again, the, 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 excuse me, the manual that they're talking about, as far as procedures, which we're lacking, you know, needs to be developed rather than put off. And that's just going to take more time and more manpower. So. Uh, Mrs. Herobit, Mrs. Minupelli, and then Mr. Masiri, okay? You're all set. Mrs. Minupelli. I thought that we were, we had discussed putting it in that special fund, though, just to, for the purpose of the <coughs> temporary employment of the inspectors that needed to go out and do the inspections just on Pulte. So we knew that, we anticipated that would cover that cost and just be directed to that particular function of the inspectional services for the time frame that those buildings were coming up. But it would appear to me that we're going to have more significant influx, influx of cash just on the short term. <clears throat> than the need for the additional outside services. And I think that could help supplement the needs of the department right now. And then the increase in the fees could either replenish that or <coughs> supplement it going forward. It just seems as though the demands are here now. We haven't been able to meet those demands uh, with human resources yet because we haven't appropriated the money for it. And we, we haven't done any hiring to take care of the Pulte needs yet. So, I mean, we haven't spent the money and we haven't hired the people yet. And the, the demands are here now. Right. So it's, uh, you know, to me, you know, we've got the resources that have already come in. We haven't expended them yet. And uh, we have a need that should be filled sooner rather than later, along with all the other operational and administrative stuff that needs to be done here. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily take a, a conservative, a cautious approach to try to, to meet it, particularly if we're going to consider raising the fee structure too. And that's just going to take a little longer for the revenue to come in, you know, as the permits come in. That's not going to be an immediate set of resources. <coughs> Mr. Messer. I, I kind of look at this as similar to the, although Munis was more money, uh, similar to Munis, in that we're making an investment in a tool that is going to have a gigantic <coughs> benefit from the day it's implemented going forward over a long period of time, not just a year or two. So fees and revenue that comes in for that can help pay for that over a long period of time. That's exclusive of the service and maintenance fee of $17,000 a year. And that's typical and uh, it's a necessary investment. So for me, I'm fully in agreement with Mr. O'Leary on this. Our new growth is our lifeline, and we need to continue to get the new growth on the books quicker, right, sooner than later. 
and I think by having the manpower will certainly help that. It helps our schools, helps us generate that additional funds to increase the increased uh, cost that they have over there and the increased cost that we have here in, in town government. So uh, I'm in full agreement. We should have a strategy to implement this as presented. Thank you. And you know, to get the fees structure, whatever we have to get through, whatever hearings we have to have, we should get through that, Mr. Schultz. Uh, Mr. Noel, just a quick question. I certainly agree that while the Pulte project is going on, you, you need more manpower. What happens though when the Pulte project is, is built out? Would we still need that extra additional body? You can look at the you can look at the economy. If the economy is if it goes south, you can always you know scan. pull back. You can, yeah. scan, you can scan back, and we also have an inspector who basically is uh, uh, on a, on a verge of retirement. Okay. So it's well, and, and again, if you believe in the strategic plan we have, and we talk about what's coming and the potential change that we have for implementing storage at some point all the procedures are a big that's a big hurdle and that's a very important part of the process oh huge, huge. so you know there's plenty of work to be done regardless even if we see a slowdown in the next 10 years i still think it's the demand is there and 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 part of the issue here too is we're getting a new building code we just received one two years ago we're getting a new building code july of i just found this out uh, of this year I don't know if it's definitely going to happen, but uh, usually when they say it's new, it usually takes a little bit longer. But if we do get that new building code, that's a whole, that's a whole another ball of wax I have to deal with. That's also books I have to buy. We're probably looking at two, three thousand dollars in books I never even budgeted for. Um, all new building code. I just, like I said, I just recently found this out from the state inspector who was here uh, last week. Any other questions for Mr. Noel? FinCom, please. Uh, yes, Jerry. So you've inferred that the permit approval or delivery times are delayed with the higher usage ratings with the high demand recently. Is that the case? Oh, I have. Is that kind of I have applications case? sitting in my sitting on in my box right now that are probably three weeks old. Okay, I can't so even. I, I can't even work. get to them. Okay. Don't have Thank the time. You. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Jerry, this is your first presentation of the board? Correct. Right, and you're, I will just tell you that uh, we, have, we really appreciate this your first year. You've done a great job. Thank you. We know this wasn't easy coming into a new community. Um, and you know, we certainly had our old ways of doing things. And we appreciate you helping us get to the 21st century uh, operations. And uh, I want to thank the Director of Public Safety, too, I'm assuming. He spent a tremendous amount of time with you. He did. Uh, he did. Yeah. And hopefully he found that as a benefit. Too. Oh, huge. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah. thank you for your time this evening, and I'm sure we'll see you back here in the next few weeks. Okay, great. Thank you. And this information is great. What a help. I have no clue. Thank you. You want to introduce your team? Yes. Uh, to my right is board member Karen Martin, board member Sam Baff, uh, Chairman Gary Hunt, and the administrative assistant Amy DeChara. Thanks for coming on the team. Uh, let me first just say uh, thank you, Chairman Prisco and the select board, uh, Chairman Herbert, and the finance committee, town administrator Mike Gilberto. Finance Director Mrs. Rourke, uh, Public Service, Public Safety Director Mike Murphy, members of my Board of Health, uh, members and staff, uh, for the opportunity to present the Health Department budget on behalf of the Board of Health. Um, so the outline for this evening is going to be uh, basically the Board of Health mission statement, an overview. Uh, notable achievements, impacts of the new food code, uh, three-year surge in public health services, 
FY20 forecast, new and state federal food codes. Uh, performance workload indicators and opportunities. Um, the Board of Health uh, mission statement, Oops, sorry, um, is to educate, promote, improve, and protect the public health and the well-being well of the citizens of the town of North Reading, while contributing to building a healthy community and environment in which to live in. The FY19 overview. This year, the town of North Reading has been presented with public health challenges and opportunities. The Department of Public Health is supported by its board members and the North Reading administration. As a team, we have faced these challenges with professionalism and accountability. The accomplishments have been focused on promoting and protecting the public health and the well-being of the citizens of North Reading. Some FY19 uh, notable achievements uh, in public health. Um, the state has developed new federal and state food code regulations that went into effect on October 5th, 2018. Those food codes were approved by the Board of Health. That's basically standard procedure. Um, the Health Department and the Board of Health developed and implemented new Board of Health food protection rules and re regulations along with the risk categorization, which I'll get into a little bit later in this presentation. Facilitated new food code educational classes for the business community here in North Reading. Our first class will be coming up March 13th, 11th, excuse me. Um, environmental programs, um, we've implemented qualifying applications and license exams for new Title V installers to bring some accountability and transparency with the Title V program. Community well-being, active participation in the community <coughs> impact team and coalitions. Developed and implemented new Board of Health tobacco control regulations, working with the CIT and the Director of Public Safety. Established new Board of Health subcommittee uh, and appointed a chair, Mary Samos. Um, and we worked very hard with that with the Director of Public Safety and the Town Administrator, Mike Gilberto. Uh, public health nurse designated as a special employee. That position was, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Emergency preparedness for state and public health region A coalition. Animal, pest, insect, as well as noise and odor monitoring and control procedures and intervention. Public safety team inspection initiated under the direction of the Department of Public Safety Director, which I will comment briefly on that, that is going extremely well. Um, and very supportive of the, of the health department. Citizens providing professional, factual, and timely responsiveness with all community interactions. As you know, we've had some challenges over the last year here in the community, um, and we face those head on. Board of Health three-year surge in public health services, as you can see from this chart. Um, Board of Health permits reviewed has increased by 15% since FY15 and 16. Board of Health permits issued and signed off have increased uh, since FY15, 16 by 220%. The Board of Health inspections have increased by 32% since FY15, 16. Board of Health complaints have decreased since FY15, 16. And I will just make a note that it's my assessment that the decrease in the complaints can be attributed to new health department policies, procedures, water health regulations, and working collaboratively with the public, health, uh, public safety divisions. As you can see from this chart, this just coincides from the last page, just to show where the spikes and the increases have occurred uh, with public health services. Impacts on the new state and food, federal food codes. Under the old code, uh, restaurants or food service establishments did not have what's called a risk categorization. Under the new code, the Board of Health had to adopt the risk categorization level and place all food establishments here in North Reading in a risk categorization level. Risk categorization level, mandated inspections, and number of establishments in North Reading. Under the old food code, 
The health department was required to do two inspections yearly, once every six months for food establishments. Under the new federal food code, food establishments are placed in, again, this risk level, which is risk level one, two, three, and four. As you can see from this chart, if you're at risk level one, you're required to get one routine and one follow-up inspection per year. Risk level two is two routines and two follow-ups per year, and so on, and so on. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, Bob, could you just explain what would be like an example of a risk level one establishment versus a risk level four? Uh, yes, Chairman Schultz. Um, so basically a risk level one would be a basic convenience store. I'll give you an example, uh, Convenience Plus. Um, because it's just prepackaged foods and there's no food handling, um, that's considered a risk level one. Um, a risk level two may be a convenience store that has food preparation like 7-Eleven, Speedway. Uh, most of our sit-down food service establishments uh, would be a risk level three, and a risk level four would be an establishment that is considered a highly susceptible population like the nursing home down on North Street, or an establishment that uh, specializes in specialized processes like curing or sushi rice or uh, reduced oxygen packaging. Thank you. You're welcome. What's not, in, what's not included in this is deficiencies um, that are not included in this risk level. So that could be food complaints, um, that could be festivals and events that we have to prepare for and inspect. Um, I do have a breakout of that, so I can make that available for the select board at any time. Um, what the, you know, the association of the breakdown is there. Before you, before you go on. Yes, sir. Could you go back to that slide where you had a um, second slide, I think it was? This one? Nope. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. There, right there, right hold right there. Because it, it looks like... Um, <coughs> so everything you're presenting going forward from here, the thing that I'm interested in, I, I, when I went through your budget, too, I didn't notice it. With the change in the marijuana laws and the change now in the food that's being generated with these CBD oils, do we have to change? And do we need to be, our risk levels need to change? Do, and is that going to be covered in this budget, in this presentation at all? No. Um, tobacco. tobacco is, yes. Well, legalized marijuana is, is obviously permitted by the state public health department. But uh, we're seeing it showing up in these conveniences. Right, yes. CBD oil foods. Yes. Do we have a plan for this? It's it's not under the tobacco regulations. It's not. No. It's not. What it's about vaping? Uh, along the same vaping lines? Vaping is. So it's if cool. the CBD oil is in a vaping form, then it's legal for them to sell it. That's one of the things that uh, the health department, uh, director of public safety, and the CIT group is looking at. Uh, we do know, uh, our concern from the public health department is the edible aspect of it. Yeah, mine too. Um, because under the federal food code, it says you cannot infuse food products with these types of ingredients. Um, that's a violation of the federal food code. However, the state, department, state public health department approves it. So there's a contradiction there, in my opinion. That's why you see states like New York, Maine, have banned, and I believe it's on the state level, have banned edibles in these forms. So that's one of the things that we're researching now um, to see if that's something that we can implement on a local level. We're not sure if we have the jurisdictional authority to do that, um, but it's worth researching that so that hopefully these edibles don't get into these convenience stores that we have now. So when you get to the FY 2020 objectives, will we see that in there or is that something you're going to add? Or? Um, that's, that's on one of my objectives, but I didn't incorporate it in this, but I have that in the annual report. Um, but I can certainly get you that. I, I don't know how the other board members feel. I'm just telling you my concern in, in listening to the community, people, families in the community, this is a big concern. Okay. And you know, we don't address it in our budgets to make sure that we, you have the resources to be able to yeah. respond to this or to put planning in when you are uh, visiting these convenience stores that are offering these foods now, brownies, gummies, all this stuff that offers it gum. Now we're seeing a gum. Um, I well, just, I just well, want I can, to make sure we have a plan. Well, I can say as Director of Public Health, I know that this board here is working very closely with Amy Luckowitz, who was our, our grant and drug-free uh, director, 
and also working closely with Mike Murphy, who is the Director of Public Safety. So we're constantly in communication. We're constantly updating the tobacco control regulations for the betterment of the community, and we're looking things very methodically and moving forward with them so that when we do amend the tobacco control regulations that we do it and we do it right. So that is a concern of this board, it is a concern of the CIT group and that is something that we're taking a look at currently. It doesn't have to change this year but I think going forward my suggestion would be in that narrative you provide us with the budget that you need to touch upon it because it's not going to get any better. I think it's going to get worse and I think we as a community owe it to our residents, especially the parents that have young kids that could have a kid, you know, 12 year old kid pull up on a bicycle, go in a, a market here in town that offers these edibles <coughs> and buy them because there's no age restriction, am I correct? Um, I believe you have to be over the age of 21 to purchase them. I didn't read that in the law, but I could I, be I, wrong, but these are the things that I want to, we yeah. should have this included in our okay. budgets this year to make sure we capture, that's the knowledge that I have and you have different knowledge. We need to get it clear to the community. We need to get it right. If we need more money in the budgets to address this CBD oil, and, uh, the marijuana stuff, then you know maybe you need to come back and bring it to us. But I didn't see it. I haven't seen it yet, and I just wanted to touch upon it. So as you're going through this, if you missed it, please point it out to me because it's a big concern. Well, conversely, if we're going to be frustrated because there's a, as you say, a conflict between you know federal and state regulations and the ability to police it, can we do it at the local level? The answer is probably no. But I mean it. it if we can't, and there's a certain level of frustration, then you know it should be brought again yes. to this forum so that we can get, then right. press, you know, our legislators and congressmen to, right. to take some action and have the board take a position, keep it in the public public eye, and uh, at least do what we can proactively from a legislative standpoint to give us the tools to uh, address it locally. So, but if we can't do it, we need to know that sooner rather than later. And, and well, again, as I mentioned, that's something that we're we're actually researching now. So, if, if we can on a local level enforce that in the last several years this board has had the fortitude to take things to town meeting get them approved and then take the risk of going going through the attorney general's office and going to disapprove and we've taken the lead on things like that to be very innovative and i think in this area maybe it, we have a lot of smart people in town maybe we can still continue to be that innovative this board has never been afraid to submit something get it approved by our voters and then bring it to the town to the attorney generals uh, for consideration because you know, someone has to start making some serious decisions about this uh, before we have a problem and it's on the horizon. So uh, I, I know I'm leaving, but I know the members that are on this board uh, have that fortitude, and I think that you guys should take advantage of that Thank if, you. if it helps. Thank, Thank you. you. Please continue. So getting back to the impact on the new food code. <laughs> and you look at the slide here, you can see that the hours required to perform inspections annually under the new food code uh, will increase by about 160 percent. Uh, currently right now to do 85 establishments here in the town of North Reading twice a year with follow-ups is about 350 hours. Um, with the new federal audit process, uh, inspections, it's going to generate an additional 550 hours of inspection time. Now, what that, again, what that doesn't include is food service complaints, food burn illness outbreaks or reports, community sponsored or supported uh, festivals or events, or farmers market. Um, with this new federal food code uh, inspections, um, what it does is it we have to go in as the health department, we have to uh, make sure that they are you know, ensuring that managerial controls are in place, standard operating procedures, HACCP principles, uh, employee health reviews, uh, monitoring data record keeping, extensive PIC duties and responsibilities. A lot of that stuff is not incorporated in the old code, which is now incorporated into the new code. Just to give you an example, with a risk level one, we've started to perform those inspections. I'm going to use convenient plus as the example. Generally, under the old food code, it would take me generally 30 minutes to do that inspection. When I've done their inspection with the risk level one under the new food code, it took me almost two and a half hours. And that's just a basic risk level one. Um, so there is the need for the increase of an additional 500 and 550 hours. And I'll get into the breakout of that on the next couple of slides. 
Um, looking at the Department of Public Health food um, full-time employees, um, if you look at what the current staffing is for uh, the 2019-2020 proposed budget, um, or right now the health department is budgeted for 2.4 employees. That would include the director of public health, administrative assistant, a minimal public health nurse, and a Title V plan reviewer. Um, if you look at 2014, prior to me coming on board, um, we had a director of public health, an administrative assistant, public health nurse, um, and two part-time food inspectors. Um, what I want to make a note with this slide is, is with a decrease in staff and the recent increase of submitted applications, permit reviews, requested inspections across the board in the health department, staff has seen an increase of workload from 300% to the administrative assistant and 500% to the health director. I have a breakout of this. I can provide this to the select board if requested. Yes, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it's quite evident that you need additional manpower or you definitely need some additional help. I mean, is there, no, given the new regulations, is there no aid available from the state or other sources to help offset some of those costs? No. So they're just asking us to incur it all, essentially? Yes. Thank you. It's, you said these are federally mandated, not state mandated? These are state and federally mandated well, requirements. State mandated, if it's state mandated, then there is a mechanism to go to the uh, Division of Local Mandates and the State Auditor's Office, have it evaluated and pass the state. If the state passes it, the requirements on to us that are a cost, they're supposed to reimburse us. If it's federal, different story. Yeah, to be honest with you, uh, Selectman, I've never heard of that. Because this is mandated by the State Public Health Department, it's voted on by the State Public Health Council, from my understanding, through years of experience. Well, then I think um, we should put in a request to the Division of Local Mandates <coughs> in the State Auditor's Office and ask them if this would fall under the purview of a required reimbursement from the state to local communities. Okay. If they're not asked, you don't get... The law is pretty clear. State mandates are supposed to be covered. Just a question for education for myself. When you do these audits or if you perform these duties, is there a fee that's paid to get them done? Fee paid by the, the staff? The, the applicant? No. Just their permit fee. So when they permit fee. Yeah, so just so with their, all these changes, do we have to look at those fees too to adjust to all these new rules? If, it, if the manpower increases because of these change, <coughs> then shouldn't we all share in that? We could. I mean, that's something that we could present to the board. The Board of Health is um, the ones who set the permit fees for the establishments here in town under Chapter 111. Have we changed our fees in your department? Not since I've been here in the four years. Does anyone on the board know? Yeah. Gary, you know how long it's been since you guys changed your feet? They, they don't all change at the same time. They, they change depending upon uh, which ones are getting attention. So over the course of the time I've been here, they all changed at the same time. Uh, not all at the same time. Like we changed the piece structure on the, <clears throat> on the food inspections like for, uh, for festivals and, and the farmer's market and that sorts of thing. Yeah, we decreased the permit fees for that. You know, and we also increased permit fees for some other things, but we didn't do everything. We didn't do a total review. We didn't review maybe everything. Maybe we're getting, we have such a labor intensive process now that maybe from the commercial, just on the commercial and, uh, retailers, maybe we need to look at. That's all. I'm just asking if you could well, put I that down. That, that's something that, that's available to us as an option, but one of the concerns we have is passing more burden on to the regulated community in town, the businessmen. I know that there's, uh, there's concerns about that, as you would expect. Yeah. Um, and these, these, uh, these fees would then increase for all of the restaurants in town and all of the establishments being inspected. So that's always an alternative. Well, yeah. that's the problem with when the state pushes down these regulations without any support, financial support. And that's why Mr. O'Leary's suggestion is a really good one. I'd rather the, ask the question and have them say no, but if they say no, then we can get. It, then we have to go back to the community because you know, it, the burden shouldn't. It should be shared. It should be a shared pain. 
should all share in the pain. I'm not saying we should get a full 100% re uh, take care of by the applicant. I'm not saying that at all. But if our fees haven't changed in years, and we've seen this increase in regulation, and in regulation, something has to give. You know, the fees have to go up over time. Hmm. It's just, we're unfortunate. And believe me, I don't want to see the business community <coughs> impacted anymore either, but we also have to have a balance. You know, they're, they're failing it, but we're failing it. So, please, it's just a suggestion. Well, you mentioned two alternatives going to the auditor's office. And I don't, how does that work? Steve, is do you actually get the money from the state after you make yeah, that? Yeah, uh, what was the was it was it prop two and a half? I think it was at a prop two and a half. Yeah. The state auditor's <coughs> office was actually funded and created a separate division. It's a division of local mandates, local mandates, state mandates lo localities to do certain things. And right. The law requires that if the state mandates communities to do certain things, they have to reimburse those communities for those costs, much like an election. You know. Some of the election changes came about. It was determined that some of those costs need to be reimbursed by the Commonwealth to the community because it was a new required um, state mandate through the legislature, and they're supposed to pay for it. Um, Has this town been successful doing that in the past over the, for any reason? We have been the beneficiary of other communities challenging. I don't know that we have actually challenged. Uh, but again, I'm not afraid to, uh, we shouldn't be afraid to ask and, uh, and be told no, because then the onus is on the, the auditor's office to make a determination that this is not an unfunded mandate. And they're going to have to give you some sort of a solution as to how does the shortfall be made up, you know, whether it be through a fee structure, you know, or, uh, or they make a determination, you know what, we haven't looked at it this way, and yes it is. And then they then direct the, the, uh, the legislature to appropriate the funds to reimburse the communities. Because those hours that you're proposing and change is significant. I mean, you okay. don't have the cycles right now to do it, it's, it to keep up with the demand. Yeah. It's it just, in, and everyone suffers. So, um, so I, I just think we should ask the question, uh, get a determination, and um, let them assist us in you know, solving the problem. Last thing I'll say as a business owner, I don't like paying fees. Uh, it, it, it comes off the bottom line, but I'll certainly be willing to pay a fee if I know I'm going to get something processed a lot faster to continue to allow my business to run and operate and to be able to generate the revenue. If my business can't operate and do that because I have to wait two or three weeks, th that's a killer too because that's money you can never get back. So we don't, you know, we got to find that happy, happy medium. And I'm sure the business community wouldn't mind participating in this discussion. To get their feedback, because you know we're in this together. I agree with you, and and I think at, at this point for us, I think time is not a luxury that we have. No. I mean, if we look at this next slide, um, this is is what actual uh, personnel um, by surrounding communities. I did a survey of, of the staffing, and as you can see. Um, with the surrounding communities, North Reading obviously is, is staffed lower than surrounding communities, health departments that is. Um, so I thought this was important to present to the select board. Um, the next slide uh, is again one of the other things that we are requesting is additional hours for the public health nurse. Um, I'm going to allow board member Pam Bath to speak a little bit on this. Um, you want me to go off this one? Um, what the impacts of additional, what, what we currently have now and, and what the impact would be if we were able to get additional hours from the public health network. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Um, what the board has tried to do over the last several years, especially during the interview process for Mr. Bracey's position, we looked at what was feasible for the, the Board of Health in North Reading. And we found at that time that we were pretty rules and regulation driven. Um, we had to do food inspections, we had to do septic inspections and reviews, and we had to answer complaints. And there were several, you know, tobacco regulations were beginning, but we hadn't done anything more in the term of um, individual public health, nothing in individual prevention 
of disease, nothing community-wide that would have an impact on the well-being of our community. Um, so when Sue was with us, Sue Swansburg was our public health nurse for many years and did a fantastic job. She was well received by the community. She was well received at the senior center. And it's a sad day that she's moved on. Um, but for her, I'm sure it's very good because she's excited about being retired. Um, but what she did uh, was within her number of hours, she had a blood pressure clinic at the senior center, which is a very welcome and anticipated um, time frame for the seniors that are partaking in that, very important to them. Um, she did some B12 injections. The elderly sometimes um, go on these medicines that they need to have routine injections. Not something all families, if they have them available, can do. Um, so Sue picked up on that and she did that. And our, in, our flu clinics, we did when we first started, when I first started with the board many years ago, we had active flu clinics. And at that time, the, um, the town did their own <coughs> clinic. And we eventually did some billing, and we had a pretty good revolving, fu revolving fund for the revenue from that. Um, but it involved making the submissions to the insurance company. So those are the types of things that she did, as well as um, investigating illnesses that are communicable. If there is someone in the community who gets something like salmonella or giardia, um, typhoid, we don't have a lot of that. Um, but if those are the types of things that show up in the state lab, we are notified that through a system called MAVEN. And since Susan has left, Amy has been getting those phone calls. And when those um, patients have been identified, it's the Department of Public Health or the public health nurse who has to contact the hospital, their infection control system, contact the individual to make sure that they're doing well, do a little investigation about whether or not their family is sick, whether or not their um, peers are sick or their friends are sick, where do they think they may have come in contact with something like this <coughs> to prevent 17 reports of the same um, illness and then we're into a problem that is more community-wide. So that's, that's most of what Susan was doing and of course did heroic efforts last summer when we had some um, challenges here in the community with foodborne illness. Looking forward, um, it's, it, it's, we have several things that are happening, I think, in the town of North Reading that I'm very proud of. One is that Senior Center has done wonderful things for our senior patient, uh, population. We now have a youth services director, and she's doing wonderful things and will be growing, I know. And the veteran population is being served. So we have these pockets of very needy people uh, that we haven't really provided a lot from in a public health perception. Um, we have a lot of people who are homebound here in North Reading, whether they're elderly or disabled or a combination. We don't have a program of outreach for them. Um, we don't have a, the patients who, that are socially isolated, the pa citizens, I'm sorry, I'm a nurse practitioner, so I keep saying patients, but it's citizens that we're really concerned about. Um, looking at continuing the blood pressure clinic, looking at vaccination clinics. I don't know what other towns around us do. Um, I think we need to find out what exactly they do for their vaccine clinics. Um, in North Reading, we probably don't need a, a well baby clinic because so many of our citizens have the insurance and the connections with their pediatrician. But do we, would it be more helpful for a travel clinic? Is that something people in North Reading would be interested in? I think they would. Because when I've traveled and I needed to know what I needed to have, I had to go find a hospital that had a travel clinic and it wasn't really convenient. I think that's something North Reading could do. Um, a shingles vaccination. Um, elderly patients are very much looking at those. Walmart and Walgreens and those types of places are beginning to do that. Um, 
they have something called a heart safe program that you can get a grant for to be able to help um, our citizens become a healthier person. They look at the types of um, <coughs> exercise facilities. We have Ipswich River Park. We have a, there's a proposed bike path. Getting involved in things like that would be to the benefit of our citizens. So what I'm saying is we have lots of citizens who are needy, but aren't very vocal. And we need to be able to tap into that and see what they need see if there are some things that are provided by Mystic Valley Elder Services or some other community health network that um, we may be able to mesh with. But to be able to get our citizens some preventive care, some interventions if they need it, whether it's sanitation or whether it's um, environmental pollutants or something like that, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And, um, that's kind of what we're talking about, but we don't know what we have available to us, and we don't know, and we haven't done a needs assessment to figure out what that is. But I think it is important as we move along to try to prevent some of these things that are risky for our citizens. Did that answer your question? Yes. Sorry, I talked too long. Thank you. Okay, moving forward, the FY2020 budget. Um, as you can see from the administration line on, last year's budget was 143.762. The Board of Health had requested a 15.1% increase uh, to 165.530. The breakdown of that is department head and administrative assistant contract increases, uh, transfer of 11.5 from the community health line item into administration. Um, therefore, requesting an additional 5140 to increase that line item to 16640. Um, if you do the math on that, if we were to raise the public health nurse hours from 5 to 10 at $32 an hour, that would give us the figure of 16640. Um, the other increase that we requested was an increase in office supplies due to the new uh, food codes forms that we have to purchase. Um, those are $300. Uh, in the environmental health budget, um, the budget was originally 68,384. Uh, we requested an increase of 30.9%, uh, bringing that budget to 9,300. The increase basically outlined is for additional hours for food inspections, um, the additional 550 hours at 3150 per hour, which is the going rate for food inspectors, would give us that figure of 16A. What we did, uh, in the community health line as we transferred 3500 from Beaver Control from community into environmental health. It just made more sense to put it in the animal control line item. Um, and then the other increase was uh, for the mosquito control services of 1,038. So basically in a sense it will wipe out the community health portion of the budget just leaving $50 which is a travel expense for our training. Opportunities, public health. Uh, the opportunities that we have here with the increases that were requested would to continue to provide excellent level of food safety in North Reading, provide sanitation safety to the public and the environment, to provide, identify specific services through preventive health, uh, public well-being, participation with the CIT and subcommittees and coalition, provide specific and targeted social services that Ms. Vath had just spoke about, prevent and improve response to disease outbreaks, um, citizens to identify and develop response and requested services for citizens. Um, in closing, um, I want to thank the Board of Selectmen, the Town Administrator, the Finance Director, Finance Board, uh, for their continued support to the Health Department over the last year. And I'm going to hand it over for closing remarks to Chairman uh, Gary Hunt. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, yes, thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. And as Bob has, has pointed out, this has been a challenging year for us. We dealt with a, a major foodborne illness outbreak, uh, pretty much was led by Bob in the response with not too much support from the DPH because we needed to do what needed to be done. That's the first one we've had in my 33 years on the board. 
was was an, was an event like that. Uh, as we all know, the, the rodents are here to stay. We thought that that was isolated to our first encounter, but they, they seem to be all over town, and, and uh, we're, we're doing our best to control that. Uh, I'm excited about all our accomplishments, as Bob has pointed out, and, and he didn't even go into all of them. We, there are so many that we'd be here for, for a quite some time. Um, I'm also excited about who we are now. Uh, we have Bob as our health director and Amy as his assistant, uh, working full time at the board. We also have at the health department, I mean, we have, in addition to myself, we have Pam, uh, we have Mary Samost, who is also a registered nurse uh, dealing with our community health initiative on that subcommittee, and we have our new board member, Karen Martin, who replaced Mike Rickey, who comes with a background from water, wastewater, and engineering. So we've got a lot of wealth of ta talent, breadth of talent and depth of talent on the board, and that's really exciting. We can, we can do a lot of things with that. Um, I'm excited about where we're going. I think we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, some we're aware of, some we're not aware of. The emergencies, we're never aware of those. Those just appear and you have to respond. So we have to have the resources for emergency response and that's very, very important, whatever that emergency might be. Uh, and lastly, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit of, just for a moment about being part of the, the, the uh, public uh, safety group under Mike Murphy's leadership. Uh, we've worked well together as a team. Uh, we've worked with Mike in addition to, to Bob working with him on a day-to-day -day basis and we, we thank him for his leadership and his counsel and I think this new arrangement is, is working rather well. And that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Well, I, I will just say this. You, know, you talk about these emergencies. One of the things that um, I look at is the lack of emergencies. And that's just a testament to all the work that you do. People don't understand it. No one really knows until it's broken, right? Nobody has a problem until something breaks. And the lack of emergencies that you've created in town is really a testament to the work and the hours. We know how hard you're working. Um, and I know we get complaints sometimes because people aren't patient. We know, we hear it, um, but we get it. And it's to keep the people safe and, and to reduce those emergencies. And we, all, we have less and less every year. So. Thank you for your service to the community. Uh, we certainly get our money's worth. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you for your team for coming tonight. Okay, and if there's no other questions, FinCom, we're gonna cut them loose and thank we'll you. bring up uh, Michael Murphy, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Gilberto to do public safety. You wanna take a break? Does anyone need a break? Five minutes, 10 minutes, no? Wanna keep rolling? Let's keep rolling. FinCom, can we take a break? I know it's late, but my bladder is, is, is rocking right now. I need five minutes. I need five minutes. It'll allow the town administrator to get his presentation together. Yes, I did, Steve. Yeah.
Well, you're five minutes off. Well, it's actually more than five minutes. Just get, it's a one minute warning. I know, Don, right? Everyone's feeling it? These lights being down low makes it even more difficult. Tom meeting in our shared folder. I just start running all those. Last year we did it and didn't go to the list until like the second review of the thing. Like, wait, there's a list in there. Michael, the budget book used to have a table of contents. Yes. Liz, did we end up putting it in on Saturday? Did I see you working on it Saturday? I did, but there have been changes to the page. Is it not in there right now? Okay. So look what happens, and I'm just telling you, it's not me. Yeah, it should. His shift. Yeah, no, I, I was able to find it, but I spent a lot of time going up and down. You just do control find, the control F, you can search by the keywords, like go to the board, 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 go to I was just looking for the index. It mm -hmm. seems right now we're doing the 2020 budgets, so those are all there. And then our meetings, our 2019 meeting back to the year. So it's on alphabetically. It's just by order. And so there's tonight's. Yeah. And it's tomorrow, which we're not going to have this week. That's right. I have a better. You can change your views right there. It's pretty nice, but everything's right there. <laughs> sure, I do, but yeah. you, you, know how I, you know how it was in Dropbox? You have your files, yeah. and then you can see yeah. them, but you have to double PM them. Because I like that, because then you can flip to a different file as you're looking at it. There's all the presentations you saw yeah. tonight. You can take it to the meeting. If you want, if you don't have your okay. hard copy with you. Yeah. I recommend it. It was more of I use. In case a quorum show. I up. use this thing called yeah. PDF Expert. Really, it sounds like a quorum may not okay. show. I put the budget book right in there. Yeah. And then when I want to, mm -hmm. so I get in here, yeah. I can make the notes. Wow. Yeah. Right. right, and I can, I can highlight, I can move that around, I can move it over here, I can do whatever I want. I can also do like this. Hey, you can wrap the gamble and start. Andy's out there chit-chatting. Let's get started, folks. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike, get started. We're good. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have a, a brief presentation relative to the Public Safety Administration budget, uh, which is also uh, in the uh, share file folder for FY 2020. If it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, the members of the board, I just assume speak from my seat here because there is a microphone up there sure. right now. Is that okay with everybody? That's perfect. Great. Thank you. So just a brief uh, recap of uh, the uh, reason that the structure was proposed uh, in fiscal year 2018. Uh, that was February of 2018. Um, we were looking at the foreseen growth in public safety needs around substance abuse, population growth, and demographic change, as well as the impact of commercial growth. I think we've talked a bit about some of that growth in some of the budgets over the course of the evening tonight. Uh, we were looking at the transition in multiple fire department positions, the transition in the inspectional services departments, as well as the increased expectations that were being placed upon emergency management. Um, we had an eye towards the sustainability of the fire department staffing approach and the reliance on callback to provide the first alarm response, and I know we talked about that on Saturday. And then we were looking at the civilian dispatch with the potential to consolidate dispatch as civilian and free up existing police and fire personnel to address growth-related needs. Um, we also talked at that time relative to uh, uh, the um, uh, instruction from the board uh, from my position um, to uh, delegate the workload, and this was a means to achieve that. So I'm not going to go back through all of the slides that we looked at previously relative to, um, to the position last year. Uh, I have them if we need them for reference purposes. So the goals for the public safety uh, director's position in public safety administration department were the consistency of policies among the public safety departments where they were practical, a unified overall public safety <coughs> command structure pursuant to the town charter, 
the plan for long-range public safety service structure, additional administrative support for the departments that were in transition, supporting and improving emergency management structure, and a fresh eyes perspective with an opportunity for innovation led by a uniform public safety official who could challenge and question the status quo. So I'll provide a progress update, and I, I do apologize. I know that that slide is very difficult to read, so I, I hope most of the folks in the audience have their paper copy, and um, I apologize to the folks at home. But uh, th this is drawn off of an update that was provided uh, right around June town meeting. The, uh, the administration department, public safety administration department, oversaw the hiring of a new building commissioner as well as an assistant plumbing inspector over the course of the summer. Um, there was a streamlining of processes and procedures amongst the existing public safety departments as well as dedicating a liaison to town council. And I could tell you there's probably been a dozen or so times when there's been a need for a liaison between those departments and town council and the public safety director has done that uh, rather than that responsibility falling to my office, although I've been uh, copied on the communication and generally aware of the dialogue. Um, the public safety uh, administration um, function was able to establish a structure and, uh, and, ex and execute the structure for regular public safety meetings amongst the public safety departments to review and evaluate consistency among the public safety departments where they were practical. There was a budget review and analysis of all public safety departments for fiscal year 2018, 2019, and uh, in the proposed 2020 budget with recommendations being made by the public safety director uh, in consultation with the uh, finance director and I uh, where appropriate. Uh, there were uh, reviews, uh, there was a review made and recommendations <coughs> made for Board of Health policies, recommendations made to coordinate the Board of Health and Building Department requirements relative to building permits, and um, I've heard on multiple occasions that the connection between those two departments is closer now than it has been um, in, uh, in some time. Um, the uh, position assisted multiple de town departments in evaluating a new permitting software program. Uh, through the town planner, we applied for the $85,000 grant that we spoke to earlier, uh, and the public safety director opened negotiation of the civilian dispatch with the police union in accordance with the fiscal year 2019 police department budget. Um, and and all, all of this doing so uh, freed up some capacity to dedicate more resources uh, to non-public safety matters uh, where necessary um, and where they would come up. So just continuing with the progress update, you'll see this is a little more focused on the fire department, um, uh, obviously because of its size and because of uh, transition into the department. Um, public safety director guided and hired, guided the hiring and promotional process uh, processes in the fire department. They are still ongoing um, with uh, some uh, milestones coming up over the next few weeks. Um, the uh, director reviewed and made recommendations were needed to the department heads to ensure staffing levels, including contracted services, were adequate to meet public safety needs. This including, included supporting the fire chief and implementing procedure and policy changes within the fire department, and we talked a bit about that during the budget hearing on Saturday. Um, and there's an uh, ongoing review of options for the continued and enhanced um, delivery of fire department services. I think we spoke about that as well uh, with an eye towards uh, what may be on the horizon, and I'll get to that in a few moments. Um, the director assisted the fire chief in administration and enforcement of the collective bargaining agreement, the personnel policies, and personnel management issues. And again, it's worth noting for those who don't know, um, the chief is the only position in the department not covered by the collective bargaining agreement. Every other position in the department uh, is covered by either the fire department contract uh, or the uh, administrative <coughs> staff contract. So the chief is able to serve as uh, uh, someone with whom the, the chief can, the public safety director is able to serve as somebody who the fire chief can consult with relative to the administration of that contract. And that's in addition to the human resources director uh, and or myself where appropriate. The um, director assisted the fire chief and town administrator to address and resolve the ongoing false alarm response issue that we saw over at Edgewood, and we did talk about that on uh, Friday, which eliminated some, uh, sorry, excuse me, on Saturday, uh, which resulted in the eliminating the unnecessary cost to the town. Um, and the public safety director provided a recommendation and the, assisted with the installation of new programming at the fire department, similar to the police digital <laughs> headquarters. And Chief, I know you're in the audience, but it's Firehouse, I believe it's called? Uh, digital headquarters. Digital headquarters is what it's called. Okay. So I'll just kind of move forward to the work that lies ahead. 
Um, and again, I think this ties to a number of the things that we've discussed over the past couple of days relative to the fire, uh, the, the public safety departments. Uh, budget requests, uh, refining the role of the mental health clinician, including the greater coordination with the public health nurse in the, in the health department. And we saw that presentation this evening that the public health department uh, would appear to be looking in the same fashion relative to the nurse itself. Um, the integration of new resources or strategies for service delivery in the building uh, and uh, health department. In the case of the building department, we talked about the, uh, the challenges that the department uh, uh, is facing relative to workload, and the same goes, uh, and the same can, uh, should be said relative to the health department. Um, again, the work ahead establishing civilian dispatch in the police department, uh, as called for in the fiscal year 2019 budget, as well as developing a plan uh, for the potential expansion to the fire department. Um, and as was discussed Saturday, the challenges on the horizon that the fire department uh, is expected to face, uh, including um, the increasing overtime costs that we reviewed uh, annually during the budget process, the increasing call volumes, as well as the public expectation, and the desire to meet that expectation. Um, based on the trends in work-life balance and, and residents in general, the availability of personnel, uh, responding to and planning for additional growth, uh, including subdivisions, <coughs> the full day homes, um, the, uh, activity over at Edgewood and responding to the changing demographic of the community, senior citizens becoming a larger portion of the population, uh, resulting in potential uh, uh, increases in call volume. Uh, and then finally, um, the continued leadership development within the department as we've had um, some retirements and we're going through the promotional processes, uh, uh, not only at the position of chief, but also in the position of uh, in the rank of captain. Um, so I offer this as a uh, combination of an update uh, and also uh, I think uh, uh, where I feel that the, 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 the need continues to exist. Uh, we've started, um, I think, down a path and we've, uh, we've certainly mm -hmm. made progress uh, and, and spent a lot of time uh, evaluating, but I think that we are, for a variety of reasons, are at a, a point now where some of the things that uh, we've uh, not been able to implement yet, we can look to implement um, uh, moving forward. Uh, and that's the need for the position. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Schultz. Michael, what, I know when we were putting this position together, one of the objectives were to kind of take some things off your plate. Have you seen an appreciable decrease in having to deal with some of these duties? Has it had that effect that we wanted to intend? I, I, I certainly believe that it has um, taken um, the uh, oversight and management responsibility. Um, though, uh, that workload from uh, from my workload uh, has it been backfilled with other things? Yeah. Uh, it most certainly has, um, you know, depending upon the day or the issue that's come up. Um, uh, you know, my my hope uh, is that it allows us to try to it allows my position, my office, to be able to focus a bit on the strategic end of things and implementing uh, the strategic plan. Um, we've been able to do some of that. I hope to be able to do more of that. Um, and I think some of that is coming through the budget process here um, at the department level, and I think more of it will come through when we recommend the reconciliation at the end of the budget And process. I guess maybe I, my question was poor. I, has it enabled you to get to, I'm not saying you're not busy now, I'm just saying, <laughs> has it enabled you to get to the things that you wanted to get to? That was the goal of Yeah, I mean, it certainly has helped with that. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, represent that, you know, that, 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 that I'm getting to everything that I want to, because I'm not. Um, but uh, I think I've been able to get to more of those strategic initiatives um, over the past year than uh, necessarily was the case prior. Okay. Anyone else? I have a question to. So it's been a year now, and you know, I've heard even over the Saturday um, hearings, <coughs> we talked about efficiencies, and that this <coughs> position helped create maybe some efficiencies in all the departments that services uh, fall under. Uh, the director of public safety do you think that those efficiencies have saved the town money and if they have do you have a a ballpark idea and dollar value of what you think it saved us i, I think that it, it's twofold and you know I, I would love to sit here and say that we're, we're spending less money today than we were previously but I, I don't know that that ever was necessarily the goal i think the idea was looking at efficiency how do we spend the, the, the town's money more efficiently and i think that there are there are areas where we have identified the ability to do that. I also think that as we've uh, been able to dig a little bit deeper into each of these departments, we've identified areas where there's more to do. Um, and that, I think, has come through in our, in our, in our budget uh, requests within the Public Safety Division of Government over the past couple of uh, days. 
Um, so what does that mean? I think that, that efficiency frees up some resources that we could dedicate to where the needs are. Um, to sit here and quantify that, I don't know that I could responsibly do that right now. Mm -hmm. But in general, I would say we, we are identifying efficiencies and um, the, the goal is to take the resources that are freed up and to put them into other areas where they're needed. Um, well, maybe a better way to look at it is, you know, we've had some departments that have caught cost overruns yes. over the last several years. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee that with the systems now adding this position in, reducing that from happening? So, so sure. So to, to speak, I guess, to the, the biggest concern that I think we that, that, that I know that I've had and I think that, that the board has had over the past few years, the, the overtime in the fire department, I believe, and I'm going to look to the chiefs, I think we're about five percentage points behind where we were last year at this time from our conversation. In, we're 10% behind. 10% 10, 10 behind where we were at. So we were uh, in a very difficult spot come February of um, calendar year 2018, fiscal year 2018. Uh, and at this point, uh, and the board is seeing the, uh, the weekly reports, we are, um, you know, we're ahead of that at this point in time. And that's a, a much better position. And again, not because we're looking to take the resources and, and, and do something other than invest in the fire department, but, but because it makes possible the opportunity for additional training <laughs> that I know the chief uh, it finds to be very important to him personally, but for the department as a whole. Well, I think that's amazing to hear because call volume has gone up. Yeah. Right? The demand is still high and we're still 10% better. That must come from some efficiencies and stuff that have been generated through this process. I, I'm sure that it does. Okay. Yes. Mrs. Herb. Uh, Excuse I'm me, you have to speak into the mic. I apologize. Folks, I don't care. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this position of public safety officer has not been to the past year. I believe it was the call town meeting that we voted in. So the uh, the board, through you, Mr. Chairman, the board supported the uh, um, the establishing of the structure in February, which was effective in fiscal year, the end of fiscal year 2018. So we're at just about one year. Oh, okay. Sorry. Mr. Masseri? My observation is that, uh, and I don't know whether you, your the free up of some of your time has helped. Well, the department heads themselves have helped put together these budget presentations, these PowerPoints that we've had the opportunity of observing for, uh, since we started the budget process. And I think what's important is the board every year ends up making decisions based on your recommendations associated with taking the available revenue and making the best of it. And we always, I think sometimes we miss out flagging the important priorities. And I think the process this year has given us the opportunity to, to do a better, to get a better understanding of what our challenges are and what we're trying to do. And as we get into the actual balancing the budget process, I think it's going to be very valuable to us. And I don't know whether that's had anything to do with uh, public safety and giving you more time to work with the department heads. I have no idea, but I suspect it has had some, some has created some result for us. Mr. Chairman? Please. So uh, I think th I would agree, um, and, and I think it, it the the the, um, the 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 relationship is more direct. The public safety director has been uh, involved and reviewed the presentations by each of the departments um, who are presented uh, to you, and it's it, at a minimum provided feedback to the department head, and in some cases been uh, more directly involved. Um, so I, I do think that that there there is a, a direct relationship, and I think as we get later in the budget process and we're going through. Um, we're going through the exercise of reconciling the budget. I know that I'll be relying on uh, the feedback of the public safety director to prioritize the public safety needs because there are many of them. We've talked about them over the past couple of days. And um, I know his, he has a perspective and, and now the direct exposure uh, to be able to assist in that decision-making <coughs> process when we make our recommendation, which ultimately the board you know, will have the final say on. Any other questions? Uh, just, uh, just a comment. Uh, uh, one thing that I've I've noticed and is that at least there's been an awful lot of uh, candor on the part of the uh, 
department heads, and they haven't been stifled, which is good in relation to their proposals. Um, I can't always say that that's been the case in the, in the past and not under your administration, but um, you know, there were times when the department heads were not at ease in making a presentation and uh, setting out their goals and objectives and then the costs associated with achieving those. Uh, and at least I think it's been very enlightening for the board this year to, uh, to put it all on the table. You know, we're going to have to start prioritizing and resources are, are uh, limited, but it's important for us to hear and for the community to hear, you know, what our department's uh, challenges are and what we're trying to do and how we're going to try to achieve those things. And you know, we're certainly not going to be able to do everything that everybody's wishing, you know, and proposing for. And it's not like it's a big wish list. These are uh, areas which are, you know, great concern to the community as a whole, and uh, we're not able to do everything that we want to do. So, but I think what's been uh, refreshing is that it appears as though you know, the department heads uh, feel very much at ease in making a, you know, the presentation that they believe, you know, they want us to hear, and uh, establishing the priorities, uh, helping us establish the priorities, and then advocating for their uh, the services that they provide. So I think it's been very good thus far. All right, and that's it for um, the budget hearings. No other questions. I want to thank everyone for spending the evening with us. Thank you, Chief, and all your department heads for staying the long, long hours to be here. Appreciate it. You're welcome to stay to the end too. <laughs> I would suggest you get the heck out of here as quick as you can. <laughs> uh, the next on the agenda is to review the FY 2020 revenue and expense plan, which blows a hole in all the proposals that were put forth. <laughs> <laughs> Next year's will even be better. Running the uh, she is, yes. Ah, uh, yeah, that would be great. I can take that. And while we're getting set up, I again I want to thank FinCom for again making the time to attend our meetings, it's important, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Your paychecks will be in the uh, town administrator's office on your way out. Yeah, next to Fox. <laughs> you can put that in. I'll bring it up. Kate's in a hurry. Let's go. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go for it. Where do you have to go? It's only 10 o'clock. looking at review plan with trash fee, no debt cap, or which one should I do with this? Please Just continue. Just presentation. I think it might be up the top. Go for it. Good evening. Good evening. I will just note that um, the two revenue plans that we will reference this evening are in the FY20 budget folder as well as in the meeting packet. Um, and the one that we will be talking about that's the new format is the one that is dated March 4th. Mr. Masseri. As I look at the, uh, the revenue portion of the plan, I was wondering if we could add a line item and separate new growth into the normal new growth and the pulte. Sure, absolutely. I think that would be helpful in terms of understanding what the pulte project is helping our overall revenue and how we're going to use that money. Yep, you that's, that's the actual yep. And we actually have uh, something that we could probably put in that same box is how new growth is generated. Right? We have a great little presentation on it Correct. that we should throw in there so you can just look at it as well. Which uh, folder would you like that in? The uh, I would put it with these budgets. Okay. I'd put it with these re with the revenue plans that you have from right in there. Absolutely, we can do that. I think that there's some descriptions in there that I think are really helpful to understand sure. how the number is generated. Okay. So this evening we're just going to quickly go through um, how we have come up with a new format of the revenue plan 
and the process that we went through to develop this new format. So since probably the beginning of the fiscal year, um, beginning in July, the financial planning team started discussing a potential new format uh, to the revenue plan to come up with a way to better allocate uh, fixed costs to the municipal side and to the school side that are directly attributed to you know, the school department and to the municipal side of things. Um, for example, you know, health insurance that is strictly driven by town employees and town retirees, you know, what, what share does the town um, make up of the total health insurance budget? And likewise, for the school department, what share of the total health insurance budget does the, the school make up of that? for both active and retirees. We also, um, as you saw at your last meeting, um, developed a draft revenue and expenditure procedure with the financial planning team and went over what um, actually goes into the revenue plan, whether it's local receipts, tax revenue, new growth, and then what fixed costs are made up of, um, examples of those. We then came up with and agreed upon a new revenue plan format. And as I mentioned, the new format will um, allocate uh, fixed costs to the school side and to the municipal operations each year. And we'll go over some of those um, in a future slide. The previous uh, format of the revenue plan that we've been working off of did not directly allocate um, any fixed costs to municipal operations or school operations what happened was we pooled all of the fixed costs together. So whether it was debt service, health insurance, workers comp, Medicare, we took those total aggregate fixed costs and took them off of the top of available revenue. Um, and then we divided the remaining balance um, from available revenue less fixed costs to divide it 66-34 uh, between the school side getting 66% of the remaining available revenue and the municipal side receiving 34% of the remaining available revenue. The new format, um, how we tackled this as the financial planning team was we began with the old format of the revenue plan and we said, okay, what would it look like for FY20 based upon the old format. So the old format is all of our revenues, whether they're taxes, local receipts, or transfers um, from other financing sources. And then we took the fixed costs, which as I mentioned, you know, debt service, the regional school assessments, the snow and ice allocation, health insurance, Medicare, so forth. Reti county retirement is a huge one. Um, and then we came up with what would be available to the school, what would be available to the municipal operations. And we said, okay, so let's, we, we need to not harm either the municipal side or the school side. So how, how do we get there um, as a starting point? So we came up with that and um, we said, okay, let's, let's see how this actually ties out. We wanna make sure it accurately works. And if you recall, I think it was in November, we you know, went over the draft's new format, um, and here we are, and it actually you know, ties out, works, and you know, we're, we're in agreement that we're gonna move forward with the new format. And we document the process as well. Yes, at, through it, the draft uh, procedures. Mr. Gilbert. And I want to just apologize to the board. So the, the meeting packet didn't include the written procedure, which, Mr. Chairman, you and I discussed being in the packet. So we'll, we'll upload that to the fiscal year 2020 no budget folder as well. But it, ba it basically writes a narrative what you're about to see. So let the minutes reflect that Michael screwed up. <laughs> Please. I can take the <coughs> We're a team. Mr. Messier. Liz, in the past, we took fixed costs you know, debt service, et cetera, and we took it off the top, mm -hmm. and then what was left, we divided between the school and the town by a percentage. Yes, correct. And uh, changing this re reduced that original cost factor. Correct. 
allowing bigger dollars into town and school. Mm -hmm. Are we still around the same percentage? Yes, so we will see that um, on a future slide. Um, there was a minor, minor um, percentage decrease for the municipal side and a slight uh, percentage increase for the uh, school side. So we will see that in my example. Also in the, the revenue plan that is dated 3-4, that is in the packet and in the FY2020 budget folder, um, is the complete revenue plan. So my example is just of um, how we're allocating resources, uh, but the complete revenue plan is in the, the folder. So this is just um, the allocation of revenue and fixed costs that are being allocated to the municipal side as well as to the school side. So, and this is at the bottom of the revenue plan that is in the packet. Um, but the school's allocation um, needed to increase to 66% um, exactly 66.1 Six five percent, and the town was reduced to thirty three point eight three five percent. Now, I, I do want to point out a few things. Um, this is subject to change annually. Those percentages will not stay the same. It depends upon the the allocation. Um, so you know the municipal side could could grow to thirty four point one six five. And the school could could be reduced, so it, it can it can change annually. Another thing that I will also point out with the revenue plan that's dated three four, is that the town's portion of the health insurance that's listed up there under the FY twenty budget column of two point eight five, is inflated. Um, it includes the PFA amount. It also um, includes. Um, the any amount that we have in there for for new hires so the town's number is higher um, and once we meet with the IAC um, and with with the board regarding the FY20 budget for health insurance um, we will be truing up that number and breaking out the PFA portion and putting the PFA portion above the line so it will not be part of the town's allocation um, I'll also note that for the school's health insurance number, it's based upon the, a three-month average um, for a whole year, and it does not include any you know, buffer for new hires, does not include anything for the PFA. So the, the school's health insurance number That's is strictly right. based upon a three-month average um, of enrollment, and then it is with the budgeted percentage that we've been carrying of 7.5%. Um, and we uh, anticipate that seven and a half percent number being reduced, um, but you know we have favorable information um, from our health insurance provider. However, that you know has not <coughs> been discussed yet. So right now we are still <coughs> carrying a seven and a half percent budget number for health insurance. Any questions on this? But I do want to point out that. This year, and even in the past years, we've continued to see an increase in the county retirement. And this year was 7.74% increase. Yes, I, I okay. know the major fixed costs. Oh, well, here uh, it is. Drivers. Good, never yes. mind. I'll, I'll talk more after you, you present them because we need to have a quick discussion on this. So, um, you know, these are our major fixed cost drivers. We, as we have our budget hearing, um, you know, when we've trued up the budget and we have some final numbers and we, we talk about all of the increases, you know, we, we have increases in um, the regional school assessment. We'll have increases in general liability insurance. But those aren't um, substantial as, as some of these. I, I list workers' comp only because it's one of our allocated, newly allocated um, fixed costs that we attribute to um, the municipal <coughs> side and to the school side. So that's why it's there, even though you might be saying 3% isn't, you know, that's kind of typical for a year-over-year -year increase. Um, but, you know, county retirement keeps increasing 
percentage-wise and dollar-wise, um, you know, year over year. So it, it's a huge cost driver. I, and I think you have to, the, this board has to have some discussion with legislators about this. Because this trend, if it continues to keep going like this, I'm not sure how you, you could sustain it. Uh, and I just, I don't know how to fix it. No idea, but you got to know that it's 7.4 this year, 7.74 this year, and it may look the same next year. And that's a difficult trend. Um, and whatever decisions made, obviously, employees that are here today should never be harmed. But the future should should be a structure that is sustainable and affordable. Uh, that's the only comment I make on that. The other thing on this slide is those aren't negatives, by the way. Those aren't not my negative seven point. No, no. They're just a dash. Yes. I just want yes. to make sure. Yep. Okay. No, it's just separating it. Yeah, because it didn't have it in the first line, but oh. the other line. So. Yes. No, they sure are not negatives. Point. They are increases. They are positive. So when do we make the decision on the help? What number we actually after the IAC, we will then that seven percent. On that chart will change to whatever we decide it's going to be. Yes. And the, good, the goal is to ask the board to act on that on the uh, health insurance on March 18th. March 18th. To make the adjustment shortly thereafter. And which I believe will then free, you know, which will create um, a, a additional revenue available to municipal operations as well as to school operations. Yep. So that leads us to. Um, this slide, where basically I'm summarizing the last page of the 3-4 revenue plan, and um, currently the available revenue for municipal operations um, is $16 million four, and the municipal departmental budget requests um, that are submitted to the select board and the finance committee um, total seventeen four. So you can see we have over a million dollar variance um, at this point in time. And um, then the available revenue for school operations is 31.5. And their overage was? So what's their gap? Yeah. They're, they have several. Uh, I, I didn't put it up there for a reason, yeah. only because they're discussing it um, with the school committee. Oh, that's right. They didn't meet tonight. And they have, um, I believe, three different. Uh, scenario so it's significant yeah. okay please continue that that's um, mm -hmm. my uh, presentation and you know a quick overview of the new format of the revenue plan um, I could have had about 20 slides but I also wanted um, it's the information to be di digested um, looking at the new format um yeah so we can come back and put this back on the agenda another time too after folks absolutely read through those documents we talked about moving the um the insurance money above the line yes and we documented it in the process as well so yeah. everything we do has been now fully documented everyone will be clear on it i think it'll be very helpful going forward the good thing is our PFA is working, and I think we're going to have a, a great opportunity to see the municipal side uh, available funds go up. We not not a million dollars, but no. um, Mr. Masseri. So if we take the current revenue plan reconstructed, yes. or reconfigured, mm -hmm. and we have a town budget exclusive of all the new needs, I'm talking about level funded budget. Mm -hmm. Same thing with school, where are we? Do we have a big gap or is that a trade secret? The town administrator has not um, made any recommendation um, for, for that at this time. No, but you but, have but all the budget no, I'm submitted. Just saying, but to the uh, question as far as, you know, where are we with level services as opposed to Departmental requests. There's right. a million dollar gap with the budget with the departmental requests. Level services puts us where? It's not an exercise that we have yeah, done. We, we haven't broken it down to that level at this, at this point, at least. No, or, to you, Mr. Chairman. Ordinarily, we have in the past going through the budget process, mostly because we've been able to. Uh, we've been coming in with recommendations, so I can show you what we're recommending. You know, as, as close to where, or being as close as possible to what our revenue revenue number will be. 
I mean, we, I think <coughs> the finance director and I know anecdotally what the major issues are. We know the positions that we've talked about over the past couple of days and the positions that will come up over the next few weeks and, you know, a, ball, a ballpark sentiment. But, you know, not, it's nothing beyond that right now, purely because we really are trying to construct the entirety of the budget from the ground up through this budget process. So it's uh, somewhat by design. When do you think we'll have some idea of the challenge that we face? So the way I anticipate things will, will flow uh, through the budget process is that we'll uh, be looking to meet with the Insurance Advisory Committee between now and the March 18th meeting. And on March 18th, uh, finalizing things relative to um, health insurance, uh, and then going forward with the financial planning team, updating the revenue plan between the March 18th and the April 1st meetings. The April 1st meeting is also the last departmental budget hearing. So that evening, I, I expect we'll be able to show the totality of, well, I think the question that's being asked here, wh where are the things that are kind of above and beyond the level services and where do we stand with the available revenue? That would be on April 1st. I, I raised the question because uh, two of us come beginning of May will no longer be here. And there'll be new members who have not participated in any of the budget process. And it would seem to me that bringing, getting the budget down before the beginning of May, getting it down to a point where we've dealt with the challenges that all five of us understand yeah. would be very helpful. Mr. Gilbert. So to speak to that, I'm certainly mindful of the calendar and also the timelines we have to follow relative to town meeting. So based on the meeting schedule that the board set on uh, well, last Monday at, at its meeting, the intention would be to uh, complete the uh, departmental budget hearings on April 1st to show that updated revenue plan at that same evening to give you a perspective of um, the challenge that we're looking at and how much of that challenge is new items versus existing items. And then taking the window of time between that meeting and the April 22nd meeting to present to the board a series of adjustments to reconcile a budget. Uh, in this case, it'll almost certainly be mostly reductions because um, I, I don't know that there'll be a whole lot in new items that will be added to it, but there may be. Uh, and so we would ask the board to review that and give us some feedback on April 22nd with the board then being asked to take a, a final vote on the budget on May 6th at the same time as it signs the warrant um, on May 6th for the June town meeting. So that's sort of the game plan that we're working on right now. And the budget hearing would be at the next meeting, which I'm assuming will be on May 20th, but I think the board's going to wait for the new members to finalize that date if I heard correctly at the last meeting. Does that address your question, Mr. Masiri? Yes, it does. I, I, I just get concerned that, you know, where we're going to be like in crunch time and I would like to leave the board with some general feeling that I participated in the budget process and that we're, we've made some reasonable decisions about what we can do rather than bypass the time that Michael and I leave and new members get involved but making those final decisions. Not that I'm against new members. I just think that they haven't been to all of what we, we go through each year with the budget process. Through you, Mr. Chairman. So the schedule I, I just described, as well as the intentions relative to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee's work, are to do just that, so that the, the board is finalizing yeah. um, uh, the Capital Improvement Plan, the budget, and uh, the warrant itself before the election. I think that first first meeting in April, I think you're going to, will be in, you'll have a lot more information mm -hmm. and see it all come together then. Exactly. Yeah. Which is plenty of time. Okay. Liz, as always, great work. And uh, the financial planning team meeting uh, has been very supportive of the, the new plan. They've certainly participated from beginning to end and I think everybody's finding that having the written document extremely helpful and I would ask that uh, again it's the March 4th right it's the March yeah. 4th date mm -hmm. revenue plan watch that but that will change after we meet with the IEC
Yes. And then this board will make a decision on the 18th of what we want to do. And but I will just say this: it's something that we should be thinking about when we leave tonight. Um, you know, we have the PFA, and I think we should work hard to preserve that PFA. We don't need it. Yes. We're potentially seeing a 2.5 percent increase in our Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, number, not seven percent. Uh, and I think we should try to preserve as much as we can. I would just note on, on that, that figure regarding uh, Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield, um, everybody just needs to keep in mind that that figure does not include the, the PFA. So we, That's right. You know, that, that figure will be slightly larger, um, including the PFA. So mm -hmm. and yep. We will review that on March 18th. All right. And there will be an updated revenue plan on April 1st. Um, that will be reviewed with the financial planning team on March 25th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And next Thank we're going to review a draft list of the June town meeting warrant articles. And I think we can do that pretty quickly. <coughs> Through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I put in the meeting packet a, uh, a copy of the current draft list. That, that draft includes only the routine articles that we uh, would normally do at the the uh, June town meeting. Um, the one article that is, uh, I'll call it new, is that I've included the um, transfer uh, out of the health insurance budget, presumably, and into the participating funding arrangement, or PF PFA, um, in, that, uh, in that listing. That fund was only established last June, and we renamed it and um, capitalized it in October. We may not opt to capitalize it in June, but I wanted to provide us the opportunity to do so. And I kind of draw the comparison to the solid waste um, budget where we take the money that we don't anticipate expending and, and move it right before the end of the fiscal year. We could potentially do the same relative to health insurance if we so chose. I'm not sure whether that's advisable or not because there is quite a lag time relative to the billing for the health insurance, but also for the processing of the PFA. So we just may not be able to, but there's a possibility that we could. So that, that is the only article that you'll see that is um, new uh, on there. Um, you and I, Mr. Chairman, have discussed the potential for a submission of a warrant article relative to um, special education, yes. tuition, and transportation. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Article. Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk to it real, real briefly. Uh, as we, you all know, we do have a, uh, a, sp a special education stabilization account that we have never funded, and one of the main reasons is it just the way it was structured under the uh, the Mass General Law. It's it's not user friendly. So back in 2016. Uh, under the Municipal Modern Modernization Act, the governor signed a bill that now has given the towns an opportunity to create what they call a special, a SPED reserve fund. Uh, Mass General Law C40A, Section 13E. And what's nice about it is under that structure, it allows now us to create a new special, edu special education fund, reserve fund that we can fund up to 2% of the school's budget which is roughly about $500,000. And, um, and the reason for that is, you know, the schools, as the town's growing, and you heard tonight all the building permits uh, that continue to keep rising, uh, our new homes coming in. And when we have, uh, we, can, we, we approve a budget in the one July, the kids get out of school, and then over that summer, you could have new people moving in town, and the schools are impacted with, with unforeseen students that need sped support and you could see some of them have a hundred thousand dollars or more expense what this fund allows us to do is to start to create a reserve and fund this reserve over a period of time so they have the ability to pivot and they don't have to go into their operating budget or cut into the town government's operating budget for these required um, demands of service that we have to do we have no choice so what's nice about this fund is that it allows us to go to town meeting. We request this, the approval. We don't have to fund it all at once. We can even handle it like we do OPEP. We can make a commitment to fund, put $25,000 a year, $50,000 a year, up till we get to that $500,000. But the other thing about this fund that I like is that the, the, we don't have to go to special town meeting to get the, or go to town meeting to disperse the funds. The requirement is that the board, the select board, and the school committee jointly will vote to determine how we use those funds and when the need arises. 
And that's what's nice about it. So there's some control on both sides. It's full disclosure, full communication. But this is forward thinking, and it doesn't now, we can come up with a fund that keeps us from running into getting caught off guard, which could have a very negative impact on both operational budgets. So that's why I'm asking for us to support a warrant article to create the SPED reserve fund. Mr. Masseri. Is the cutoff for citizens' petitions for our June town meeting? Monday, March 18th at 4 o'clock p.m. Have we any citizen petitions filed? I'm not point? aware of any at this okay. point in time. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, Mike. So, Mr. O'Leary? I think, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a, another opportunity that's finally been presented to us that uh, can assist us in uh, addressing surprises as they come. <coughs> and uh, we've seen it over the years, you know, in the budgeting process. And when, you know, family moves to town and there's a special needs uh, a student and it has a significant uh, economic impact on the school department budget and it was never anticipated. So I think this is a, a good opportunity for us to uh, take a measured step in, in addressing the situation. So I, I would endorse, uh, it's, I would imagine the school committee is in favor of it, but have they taken a Well, they weren't going to take a vote tonight, but their meeting got canceled. Oh. So how this all turned around was we were under a timeline. So the solution was, if I can get the board to support this, we would task the town administrator to draft the warrant article in the board of selectmen, or the select board would be the uh, sponsoring well, of well, it. It could be a joint because joint sponsorship, but that's fine. It, it was, could be, I, but I, unfortunately, by the time they meet next, we're already going to be at the, um, the deadline, and they're not going to have time. Well, that's for citizens' petition. We've inserted articles right up to the last day. Yeah. So. Um, Mr. Gilberto, I don't know if you so want to maybe help me out, maybe I didn't explain it right. No, I, I think you're both right. <laughs> so the board has a, a deadline of uh, March 18th for the submission of warrant articles by other parties. And that I don't want to say that that guarantees them, but that gives a strong likelihood that the board will include them by tradition. Um, when you pass that deadline, it becomes a bit more complicated, although the board does have the ability to add a warrant article right up until it signs the warrant. Yeah, we do it all the time. So it's just a matter of yeah, if the article. it's a great idea. But, but to that point, if the article was going to be proposed by the school committee, it would need to have been received. The board could have opted to then favorably accept it or could still accept a submission if it wanted I'm to. I'm pushing it tonight because I just don't want to miss the window. Exactly. But if um, we would love to jointly support it. I mean, I talk um, the school committee hasn't had an opportunity to go through it, but the two school committee members that participate in the financial planning team are fully in support. John Bernard's in support, Michael Conley's in support. Uh, I sent you a presentation that sort of highlights it, which when we have the one article handling, so we'll go through that to, yes, Mr. Sarah. I think it's a good idea, but I, I raised the question of both town and school side. It's very selective, one particular kind of surprise. When in any given year, there can be surprises on both ends in different categories. <coughs> Should we be thinking of a more general fund? Um, I think this one's authorized, uh, the new authorization from the state legislature, which allows the money to be appropriated, available, and then not require town meeting vote oh, okay. to, to, yeah, to, to, right. to reallocate it. Right. Right. I think that's the key. That's the most important yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Minnie. And then it also, it can remain there the following year. It doesn't revert yeah. back yeah. to right. free right. cash. It yeah. stays It stays with it, right. Up to the, the percentage of their budget. Yeah. You know, we can continue to find uh, grants that may be able to allow us to support and, and, and place it in these funds, too, as well as we go along. So the fund gives us a lot more flexibility, but the best part is jointly we can decide when we want to disperse the funds. And I would ask the board that we don't have it anywhere in any budget where we, we want to maybe fund this, but I think we should try to find some money to start the kickoff in funding it. Whether it's 10000 20000 50000 we should do something. But we could talk about that at another time. But that's it on that. That's all I have for my warrant article. Oh. Yes. But we could still move to to get this in place to establish the fund. Even without any funds, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. We should do it. Check okay. I agree. Mr. Mr. Chairman, three. Yes. Uh, the only other article that I'll note is the board did have a discussion relative to a so-called plastic bag ban um, uh, earlier. 
Uh, it's not on the list. It's here, although I have contacted my counterparts uh, in the area, and I have received um, actually a decent amount of feedback from them. And my intention would be to go to the uh, Department of Public Works as a manager of the Solid Waste and Collection Program um, to ask them to submit an article that reflects that. That's my intention at this point. And the yeah. board can consider it, and it will have multiple meetings to decide the form that it wants to see it in, and final form, bring it to the town meeting. I think we have full support to do that, from what I understand. I'm expecting to see it there. Maybe not. Maybe we don't have full support. I'm not for the plastic. <laughs> I am. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just yes. have one, uh, one question and a potential suge suggestion if we need it. Um, I've been approached by some other committee members on, on some of our appointed boards and um, on uh, remote participation by board members. And we've seen it evidenced, say, in Andover, you know, where there's a quorum present, <laughs> but someone's, you know, FaceTiming. Yeah, you know, FaceTiming or in Florida or something, whatever. Uh, but can still participate, vote, and all the rest of it. You just can't help form a quorum. I don't know if that requires a bylaw change or, <coughs> or not. But I think uh, you know it's about time we can come into the 21st century too with the technology that's available. And if uh, I think it's something we should consider doing, if it takes a bylaw change, fine. If it doesn't, I don't know if let's it takes find a bylaw out. change. Yes. So at the time uh, the law came into effect, and I want to say it was 2013 or 2014. Um, in another community while working with the select board, we instituted, uh, we adopted the policy, which was able to be done by the selectmen uh, without a, uh, a vote at town meeting, and they were also actually able to promulgate regulations to govern its usage, which applied to any board or committee that, that used it as a tool. So I, I don't know whether that law has changed or not, but uh, at that time, I know the board was able to, to enact it. And yeah, the biggest restriction was that you did need to have a quorum in the room in order for it to be uh, used. Um, and then the, the members above and beyond that could certainly participate remotely. Yeah, so, so I think, I, I don't know what the rest of the members of the board feel, but you know, to me, I think it's uh, an opportunity that we should avail to uh, not only this board, but other boards, committees, and commissions um, to allow for full participation. Again, someone may be home ill, but still capable of participating. And, and again, you, I found that some of the, um, particularly the Conservation Commission, Right now we have a, had a problem uh, getting a quorum, so this would not remove the need for a quorum present in the room. But we have some long-serving members on that commission uh, who would add valuable insight to the conversations and are being precluded from doing so because they're out of state on business, you know, or they're recreating somewhere but would be willing to uh, participate. So I think, it's a, I think it's a good tool that we should uh, offer to our, our boards, committees, and commissions. Mr. Messier. My understanding of that practice requires a roll call vote on everything during the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Sounds right. Okay. But, so I don't. I don't know if if it doesn't require a, a bylaw. You know, can we at least uh, have uh, the administration inquire of town council? How do how do we go about implementing yeah. it? Unless it's not a majority support to implement it. I don't know what everybody makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. If we could just touch base with town council and then we can even. If it has to be a warrant article, then if we can put a placeholder in there, let's do it. I will contact town council. Great. Anything else on warrant articles? How many is that total right now? 21? 22 with the plastic bags. Still looks like a one night meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till I start talking about plastic bags. <laughs> That depends on the detail of the article who's in support of it. Yeah. No, but is plastic bags going to be on that? Yeah, uh, plastic bags will be one of them. Now, will we have full support? I don't know. Semi full. You guys come around the mic, wave, thank you. Well, full support. <laughs> the majority support, maybe. <laughs> Bring it into the 20th century. I'm in support. 21st. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else, we'll go to the town administrator's report. Mr. Chairman, I'll just note that I've been contacted by the town manager in Reading who advises me that their uh, police department, uh, I believe their, engi their engineering department, and their select board has been reviewing the, uh, the speed limits on the different segments of Haverhill Street in Reading. Um, so he wanted to make me aware, uh, and I've made the police and uh, DPW 
aware that there's a review that's ongoing, and they've broken the street down into various segments where the speed limit is a different, um, a different uh, speed uh, within each segment. Um, so I'll forward the detailed presentation in the town administrator's report for the next meeting, but I just want to make the board aware in case you, you hear some discussion about it. Did they recently change it? The speed limits on that road? I don't believe they recently changed it, but I believe well, they're they looking to go to a uniform Mass speed DOT limit. has to, right? So I believe that they're looking, that they, that I believe there was a recommendation for a uniform speed limit of, I think it was either 30 or 35 miles an hour in the presentation. I noticed the other day it changes at different parts. It does. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, there's four or five sections of it that they studied um, and had different crash data and compliance information. I'll forward the presentation that was part I mean, of the Every, every street's the same way, even yeah. Dr. Every, almost every street in our town changes yeah. those little segments. Even a little Bishop's Way where I live, there's some section of it's faster than others. It it's is? Weird. It is, yeah. When we were at Mass DOT, remember <laughs> we were having the issue with, I forget why we were there, the guy pulled out the book and showed me. <laughs> so they have it broken down. Every street, the speed limit could change in different sections because of curvatures and stop lighting. They take all that into account. So. Anything else? I Have you report. driven down Route 62? Yep. And watched the signs? Yep. They change a lot. They change a lot. They change a lot. All right. Uh, well, I guess that leads us with old new business. We'll start with you tonight, Mr. Mary Mr. Schultz? No. Mr. Masseri? Just to uh, note that uh, a April 7th for a seven days out. Not available. Okay. I mentioned, he, he mentioned that to me earlier, and I thought that was unacceptable since he's, you know, finishing out his term and is blowing us off. I don't oh, know. He can beam in, though. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I was going to say, if, yeah, if we, if we guess, accept this bylaw thing, <laughs> <laughs> soon enough, you can participate. Well, for I'm going to be with, I'm going to be I've gone at the same time, Mr. Messier. You too? April 3rd to the 12th. Yeah, they can beam in. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I. Plan the meetings around my my trip. Yeah. All right. And anything else, Mr. Masseri? All set. Yeah. Okay, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just you know, to my colleagues and administration and uh, members of town hall and members of the community over the last week or so, uh, everybody's been communicating their condolences and the passing of my mother-in-law. So it's greatly appreciated by my wife Sue and uh, my family, and appreciate the expressions of sympathy yeah. and, and the outreach. Yeah, sorry for your loss. Uh, we live in a great community, so it's. Uh, Appreciate it very much. That All right, that'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.